used to create the black hole. As after the black hole is evaporated, the Hawking radiation has very little information. So where did the information go? However, the, the, um, the thermality of Hawking radiation should be, even for an uh, ideal black hole, should be limited by gray body factors. Um, now, the problem with verifying Hawking's predictions in a real black hole is that the, um, the temperature of Hawking radiation should be extremely low. For a, a black hole of a few solar masses, the Hawking temperature is less than a microkelvin, so it's completely overpowered by the cosmic back, uh, background radiation. So, but perhaps in the early universe, there were primordial black holes created, very small ones, which would have a higher Hawking temperature. But because you could say the diameter of the black hole gives the wavelength of the Hawking radiation. So a smaller black hole has a higher Hawking temperature. Um, so perhaps one could somehow find these pri tiny primordial black holes. Or in the meantime, in the LHC, um, there have been ongoing searches for black holes, which they haven't found yet, for very small black holes created at the LHC. Um, Bill Unruh in 1981 um, invented the idea of an analog black hole where sound plays the role of light. And he wrote in his paper, black hole evaporation is one of the most surprising discoveries of the past 10 years. So that was apparently his motivation for inventing an analog black hole was to check Hawking's surprising uh, calculation at the time. And he came up with the same expression for the Hawking temperature, but now G is the effective, the analog of the surface gravity and the analog black hole, and C is the speed of sound. So um, there have been many systems proposed as possible analog black holes. One is Bose-Einstein condensates, which is relevant for my talk. And there have been many theoretical works discussing Bose-Einstein condensates and um, analog black holes in Bose-Einstein condensates. Another proposal is superfluid helium-3, or electromagnetic waveguides, ultra-cold fermions, rings of trapped ions. Light in a nonlinear liquid, exciton polariton condensates, magnons in a magnetic wire, and wild semimetals. In the meantime, on the experimental side, my group has been studying um, this, this subject and only this subject since 2009. And we've made a systematic study starting with learning how to create analog black holes and then how to study the very small number of phone, very small populations of phonons in an analog black hole, since the Hawking radiation in our system is phonons. And finally, um, in these last three papers, we saw the spontaneous Hawking radiation. And Juan Ramon will be discussing this second to the last paper, and I'll be discussing the last one. So uh, another active area of study and experiments is um, surface waves on water. This is a classical system, and one can see stimulated Hawking radiation, where one sends in a wave and sees the um, creation of pairs. And another area of study is nonlinear optical fibers. And again, so far, what they've seen is, uh, is the stimulated, the classical stimulated effect. There's um, exciton polariton condensates are under study. Now I'd like to leave the subject of analog black holes for just a moment to tell about another t um, subject of analog gravity, which is an analog expanding universe. And here there are a few different um, things that one can study. First of all, the Gibbons-Hawking effect has been proposed as something that someone could study. This is similar to the Unruh effect. The Unruh effect is the idea that an accelerating observer even in flat space time, sees a thermal distribution of particles. And this is, so this is an observer dependent effect. And the Gibbons Hawking effect is the idea that the fact that the universe has a, a, a finite cosmological constant um, creates the situation that an observer in the universe will also see a thermal distribution of particles. And one can um, try and check this in an expanding Bose Einstein condensate. Another possibility proposed theoretically is um, cosmological particle production. And this is similar to the dynamical Casimir effect. And the idea is that during the inflation period of the early, of the early universe, 
Um, the expansion was so rapid that the vacuum state can't adiabatically follow and you get the production of particles. Um, there has been one experiment and they saw classical nonlinear dynamics in an expanding Bose-Einstein condensate. They saw the production of vortices and solitons. So getting back to the analog black hole, here's our analog black hole. This is um, a, a Bose-Einstein condensate. The, the whitish region is higher density and the grayish region is lower density. And this is uh, about 8,000 atoms and it's about 0.1 millimeters long. So that's a rather dilute Bose-Einstein condensate because it's rather large with very few atoms. And the diluteness gives us a larger signal for the Hawking radiation. So this analog black hole is flowing from left to right. And so if one, um, and in, in this region it's flowing slower than the speed of sound, and over here it's flowing faster than the speed of sound. So if we think of a phonon in this region going against the flow, it can go forward because the flow is slower than the speed of sound. It can go forward in the laboratory frame. Whereas on this side, with a fast flowing condensate, the phonon is dragged backwards. So so this is the analog of the horizon. The phonon on this side is unable to reach this point. So we could look at a space-time diagram here. The, um, the phonon can go forward, can move away from the horizon. Here, it falls into the black hole away from the horizon. And so this is, this is analogous to the Hawking particle, and this is analogous to the partner particle. Due to the very large Doppler shift of this partner particle, um, it has a frequency which is less than zero. So the phonon, phonon has a negative energy. So the total energy of the pair can be zero, and that's the Hawking radiation. So we're going to look for the spontaneous emission of pairs, of one phonon moving this way and one phon phonon moving this way. And to do that, we'll need to repeat the experiment thousands of times and, and see the, um, the correlations between the two sides. So um, the, the, this condensate is trapped in a laser beam. It's a long, thin condensate trapped in a laser beam. And so here's the laser beam. And it's this is the vacuum chamber. And here, the, in the middle, this is the, this is the condensate. And the laser beam is focused. And it's a red detuned laser beam, which creates an attractive potential for the atoms. There's also an imaging laser from above, and um, due to the finite um, index of refraction of the condensate, the imaging laser gets a phase shift, and that's what we image. So we have high-resolution optics here, high-resolution lens here, which images the, the, this phase shift onto a camera. Um, this trapping laser is very weak because we want that low density, so it's not able to support the condensate against gravity. So we have here a coil which um, provides a magnetic field gradient to cancel gravity. Here's the, the uh, uh, yes. yes. How long so the, is the, what is that? Uh, the condensate? Micro, yeah, micro. It's 100 microns. 100 microns. Yeah. It's not to scale, this I image. Scale. Yeah, this is, the, the vacuum chamber is 10 millimeters high which is what lets us bring this high resolution optics very close to the vacuum chamber. We were the first group to use this very high resolution optics and we achieved that simply by making the vacuum chamber so small that we could bring a lens close to the, the atoms. So, um, so in the system, this is what it looks like. Here's the, the condensate is around here and the, the laser beam, the trapping laser beam comes in from here. And you could see the, these paper tubes that the uh, laser beam goes through paper tubes. And the reason is that the movement of the air in the room is enough to move the laser beams and heat the condensate. Um, and uh, if this condensate is rather cold. It's extremely cold, colder than the typical Bose-Einstein condensate. It's less than a nano Kelvin. So, um, so this is plenty of, the motion of the air in the room is plenty to heat it up. So, um, now, we, to, in order to accelerate, we said that this region is going faster than the speed of sound. So this is achieved by a step potential. The condensate comes in this direction and flows over the step. 
and is then accelerated to, to high speeds, to supersonic speeds. So the way we achieve this step is with a laser beam. This is a blue detuned laser beam, which means a repulsive potential for the atoms. And it's coming out at us. This is like an elliptical laser beam coming out at us. It's been cut in half by a, by a knife edge and then imaged onto the condensate with high resolution optics. Now we then, so, the, um, so this is a step as, as an, if an atom will come from inside the beam to outside, it loses all this potential energy. So that's the waterfall potential. We then move this laser beam at a constant speed to the left. And we could go into the reference frame where the beam is stationary and the condensate is flowing to the right. And in that case, the condensate comes from here, flows over the step, and is accelerated to supersonic speeds. So here are some of the, some of the lenses we use to, to um, image, the condon the image of the laser beam for the step onto the condensate. So here's the condensate. Here are some lenses. And here's that half Gaussian beam, which has been cut in half by the knife, coming in. And that's located here. Here's the condensate again. And so, the big, um, so here's the optics for, um, for um, putting, putting the step potential on the atoms. And somewhere else in the um, imaging system is this rotating mirror, which is the mirror which um, shifts this laser beam along the condensate so that it will move at a constant speed. Now, here's a picture, an image of the condensate with the step potential turned off. So this is just the condensate. And um, it's, you, as you can see, it's a, um, extremely long, and it's weakly trapped in the, um, in the axial direction. So it's very sensitive to any sort of magnetic field gradient or gravitational gradient. So every 200 repetitions of the experiment, we take five images like this with the, um, with the step potential turned off and even the axial um, trapping, the, the trapping beam turned down in power to make it even more sensitive to axial gradients. And if there's any shift in the axial direction, then we correct with a very um, small magnetic field, which we add, magnetic field gradient. So here's this, um, the, the table with the experiment, the main table of the experiment. What we saw so far was in this region, and there you can see there are two levels of optics, and much of the optics that you're seeing is um, for cooling the atoms by laser cooling, since the first stage of the cooling is is laser cooling. And here's another view of that vacuum chamber, and you could see these various mirrors and optics for laser cooling. Yet another view. Here's a view of the lower level of the optics, and and um, and you could see a lot of these, um, these air tubes. Here's another table, which is um, with just lasers on it. And OK, so now here's the combined potential. Um, so here's the trapping beam, creates this, this minimum. And then the step potential is this little step here. Initially, the condensate is sitting at the point A in the minimum of the, uh, minimum of the potential. And so the density profile looks like this. Now, um, we then move, you could say that the minimum of the potential is moving. It's really the step which is moving, but we can be in the reference frame where the minimum of the potential moves. And, um, and the, more and more atoms pour over the step as, the, as time goes on and the potential shifts to the right. And so you could see more and more atoms pouring over the edge here. Now, what we would like to do is to compute the Hawking temperature. So um, we, we use um, the surface gravity. The analog, analog of the surface gravity is proportional to dv dx minus dc dx, the derivatives of the flow velocity and the speed of sound evaluated at the horizon. So this sharp area here, this sharp, sharp point here, that's the horizon. That's where that step potential is. The condensate's going faster than the speed of sound over here and slower than the speed of sound over here. So we want to compute the derivatives at this point. So for this dv dx, we can um, realize that, the, that the, there's approximately a constant current. So um, the density times the velocity is approximately a constant. So we can convert this derivative of the velocity to derivative of the density and obtain this expression for the Hawking temperature. 
And so we could evaluate this um, dn dx, the derivative of the density from these plot, these density profiles. Um, these density profiles are just taking this image and integrating it in the vertical direction to get these profiles. And DC, from the density, we could derive the speed of sound. Juan Ramon will tell you a little bit more how we do that. Um, and so for this, we can then calculate the derivative of the speed of sound also <coughs> at the horizon. So if we, so we could see, uh, the density profile is, is varying in time. And at each time, we could take the derivative at this sharp edge and calculate the Hawking temperature. And if we do that, we get this, this graph here. This is the log of the Hawking temperature as a function of time in milliseconds. So um, we could, the blue circles are this predicted Hawking temperature, meaning you take the surface gravity and you calculate the, your prediction for the Hawking temperature. Then we'll, we're going to look at, actually look at the Hawking temperature, look at the actual Hawking radiation and see what temperature it has and compare. So these, we see that the Hawking temperature is approximately constant until the latest times, and then it comes down. And um, so that's a little different from a real black hole where the Hawking temperature should be going up because the black hole evaporates. The black hole is getting smaller and the Hawking temperature is going up. So now we'd like to, to actually look at the Hawking radiation and then compare with the prediction. So we follow the suggestion in the literature of how to measure, observe the Hawking radiation. We use the correlation function. So here's the density profile. We, if one consider, so we imagine that the, the horizon here is emitting pairs, one going out of the black hole and one particle falling into the black hole. So if we consider two points, x and x prime, which are equal propagation times from the horizon, we should see density correlations. And that's true whether the points are close to the horizon or far from the horizon, we should still see the correlations. So if we plot the correlation function as a function of x and x prime, we expect to see a band of points. Each point along the band is a pair, x and x prime, which are equal propagation times from the horizon. Now these correlations are negative correlations. And we can understand from this paper by Stefano Giovanazzi that the, co the negative correlations implies positive mutual information uh, between the inside and the outside of the analog black hole. So here's the result. So we, we're gonna compute. So we're gonna take thousands of these images compute the correlation function and look for this pattern in the experiment. So here's the result at various times. So this is the, the earliest time and time increases as going to the right and also going down. And in most of these images, you can see a correlation band starting from the middle and going up to the left. Those are the correlations between the Hawking and partner particles. And the, all of these um, images together, uh, all these correlation functions together is a total of 97,000 repetitions of the experiment, which corresponds to 124 days of continuous measurement. So now what we're gonna first do is zoom in on, the, on, on this period here, the spontaneous Hawking radiation period. So these six profiles are showing the spontaneous Hawking radiation, these six um, correlation functions, and you can see the band of correlations in each of them. And we could convert this to a temperature. We would like to now compare this to Hawking's theory. So we wanna say, well, how, do, how can we get a temperature out of this correlation band? Well, firstly, um, the, the depth of the band gives us a measure of the Hawking temperature because a deeper band implies more Hawking radiation. The more radiation, the more stronger the correlations. And more Hawking radiation means higher temperature. So if we do this for each of these, um, each of these correlation functions, here we could look in the spontaneous period here, we get the green circles. So this is, these are a measure of the, of the um, temperature of the, of the quantity of Hawking radiation put in temperature units and we can see that the red circles agree well with the blue circles during the spontaneous period. 
So showing that the Hawking temperature is correct as, um, when measured by measuring the quantity of Hawking radiation. We can make another type of measurement of the temperature by measuring the width of the correlation band. A narrow width implies short wavelengths. And short wavelengths implies higher Hawking temperature. So this also gives us a, a measure of the, of the temperature. So that's the red, the red, um, the red pluses are, are from the width. And we see they also agree fairly well with the, with the blue circles um, for measured from, which is the prediction from the surface gravity. So the fact that the red pluses agree with the green circles means that the width of the spectrum and the height of the spectrum um, are commensurate. So it means it's a thermal spectrum. It's, it grows in height in the appropriate way that it, that it goes to higher energies. So, um, so we could see, in that sense, it's a thermal spectrum. Furthermore, the agreement with the blue circles implies that the quantity of Hawking radiation is correct um, for its spontaneous emission. And also we see this as fairly constant during this period of time, during the spontaneous period. So we could say it's stationary. So we have spontaneous thermal stationary Hawking radiation at the predicting, predicted Hawking temperature. So this confirms Hawking's semi-classical calculation. That for a semi-classical system analogous to, to the real black hole, to a semi-classical real black hole, one really does have Hawking radiation um, with all the properties that Hawking had predicted. So um, now, okay, so let, now let's go to the, this earlier period, the ramp up period. Here, we see the Hawking temperature is similar to the spontaneous, the predicted Hawking temperature from the surface gravity is similar to the spontaneous period, but the quantity of Hawking radiation is much less. So this is a, like a black hole which has a horizon and a Hawking temperature, but very little, almost no Hawking radiation. So, um, so that seems a little strange. Uh, so, um, but fortunately, we have a dashed curve here, which is some sort of theoretical prediction. So it agrees with some theory. What is that theory that it agrees with? This is actually for a real black hole um, where we've adjusted the mass of the black hole to give this same um, asymptotic Hawking temperature as in the experiment. So, um, oops, just a second. Wait. Here we were. Okay. So we um, so we adjusted the. We were looking at this curve for a real black hole. So um, we're, what we're considering here is a gravitational collapse of a cloud of dust in a real black hole. So it's a black hole with 170 solar masses, and um, and its collapse is due to its gravi gravity. And as um, as discussed in this work by Renaud Parentani. Um, one, can, one can calculate, um, they calculate the flux as measured at infinity, flux of Hawking radiation, and the time as measured, as a function of the time measured at infinity. In order to compare with our results, we realize that this flux should be proportional to the Hawking temperature to the, to the fourth by the Stefan-Boltzmann law. So we then put it on, so that's the curve that you see on, on, uh, on this graph where the origin of time is a fit parameter. So we sh the curve is shifted left and right to match the data. So um, it's sort of amusing that our analog black hole is somehow similar to a collapsing um, cloud of dust. Um, if there is some underlying principle which, which causes them to be similar, I think it would be that it takes approximately one oscillation period for Hawking radiation to turn on. So one oscillation period is around here, 130 uh, milliseconds. So now after the ramp up period and after the spontaneous period, um, an inner horizon forms. And this is analogous to a charged black hole. Um, so what is an inner horizon? So here's, um, here's the, here are these density profiles that we saw. 
we can convert these density profiles into velocity profiles. If you have, see there are several density profiles in each of these plots, we could compare them and figure out how fast the condensate is moving. It's sort of like a movie. If you have two different images of a system at different times, you can use the continuity equation and figure out how fast it's moving. So that's what, that's what we have here. So here's the black curve is the flow velocity and the, and the um, gray curve is the speed of sound. So we see that in this region, the flow velocity is less than the speed of sound. That's outside the black hole. Here, the flow velocity is greater than the speed of sound, which traps the particles. And so that's inside the black hole. If we go to late enough times, we see once the, uh, we see that the flow velocity again crosses the speed of sound. So it's sort of like if you go deep enough into the black hole, you then come back out, out, of, out of the black hole. That, and so this point is the inner horizon, where the flow velocity and the speed of sound are again equal. Now this inner horizon can produce stimulated Hawking radiation. The, um, as discussed by um, Ted Jacobson, presented us with two different um, situations, two different, um, two different mechanisms by which the inner horizon can produce stimulated Hawking radiation. Now we can ask if this is relevant for a real black hole. It uh, only, not only an inner horizon is required, but also a super, superluminal dispersion relation will be required because we're gonna need particles to come from the inner horizon out to the outer horizon. The, we're gonna need particles to go the wrong way in the black hole. So uh, a superluminal dispersion relation, it's been mentioned that such a thing perhaps could occur um, at well beyond the Planck scale. So, um, so first let's look at the dispersion relation. So here is the outer horizon, the usual horizon. Here's the inner horizon. Outside the black hole, we have the usual dispersion relation for a Bose-Einstein condensate, this superluminal dispersion relation. And here are some of the modes of the Hawking radiation. We see that the slope of the dispersion relation is negative. So um, the Hawking implying that the, the Hawking, it's moving from left to right, the Hawking particle, it's moving away from the horizon. Inside the black hole, this branch of the dispersion relation is the negative energy modes. And here are the partner particles. They have a positive group velocity, so they're, um, they're, pulled, into, they're pulled away from the horizon. But the, but the dispersion relation curves over. And so here we have um, these modes, which have a negative group velocity, so they move from left, from right to left. They move the wrong way inside the analog black hole, from the inner horizon out to the outer horizon. They can then hit the horizon and stimulate pairs. So here, here are these sort of uh, sketches, diagrams of how this works. So there's this spontaneous Hawking radiation, where we have the Hawking radiation and the partners, and there's nothing coming and hitting the horizon. Black hole lasing is um, discussed by Ted Jacobson. The partner particle from the Hawking radiation falls into the black hole, reflects from the inner horizon in the form of one of these incoming modes, comes back out to the horizon, and it stimulates more Hawking radiation. And then the process repeats. The ad additional part, um, partners also go in and, and um, and reflect. So one has this amplified, this exponentially growing Hawking radiation, stimulated Hawking radiation. So that's black hole lasing. The second mechanism, which is called monochromatic stimulated Hawking radiation, here the inner horizon itself produces um, these modes. And how does that happen? Well, you could see on the, di the dispersion relation goes, goes to z crosses zero. So this is an instability. It's a wave with zero frequency. So these waves can be created for free at the inner horizon. We can say the inner horizon um, is a point where V equals C. So it's a point, it's sort of, it's moving through the condensate at the speed of sound, you could say. And so it, it, by the Landau critical velocity, it's at the Landau critical velocity, so it can create these, these waves for free. However, um, the inner horizon is moving away from the horizon at some slow speed um, in, in our type of analog black hole. 
So that means that in the reference frame of the outer horizon, these zero frequency modes are not zero frequency modes. They're at some finite frequencies, some frequency given by um, K of the mode times the V, the, um, times the velocity of the inner horizon. This is the Doppler shift as seen by the, the outer horizon. So this is the, the second mechanism that we have these um, monochromatic, some frequencies different from zero coming and hitting the horizon. And actually Ted Jacobson invented this idea thinking about our, one of our previous experiments. So um, now let's look after, here's, here's, here's the spontaneous Hawking radiation. Here's where the, uh, so, the, so everything below this has an inner horizon. And we can see that it greatly, it, um, we're gonna see that the, the quantity greatly grows relative to this spontaneous case. So zooming in, here's the spontaneous. Here are the pictures just after the creation of the inner horizon. Um, and you could see that the, the correlation band is much stronger, much clearer than in the spontaneous period. And it gets stronger and stronger. And so we can, um, so, but in this period, in this early period, just after the spontaneous Hawking radiation, it still has, a, the Hawking radiation still has a multi-mode character, meaning in the spontaneous period, it's, it's not a sinusoidal pattern here in the correlation function because the spontaneous Hawking radiation has, has many modes. It's a thermal distribution. Um, this, this early stimulated Hawking radiation also has many modes. It's, it's also not a, a, a sinusoidal pattern. To see what a single mode looks like, for comparison, we can create, we could um, create by ourselves single modes. And the way we do that is we cause this potential, this is the step potential which accelerates the condensate, we could cause it to oscillate. And we cause it to oscillate and this um, launches waves upstream and downstream, um, into, out of the black hole and into the black hole. So we're artificially creating pairs here. We do that by, remember, this mirror, this rotating mirror here um, moves the, the potential at a constant speed. We could also add an oscillating component on the motion of this mirror on the, and, and cause the, this step to oscillate and generate waves. If we do that, the correlations functions, this is the correlation functions which result. And you see this, these sinusoidal patterns at all times, including the time which is relevant for this, um, this early stimulated Hawking radiation. So you see these, these nice sinusoidal patterns in the correlation function. This is what a single mode looks like in the correlation function. So this is not single modes these patterns that we're seeing in our stimulated Hawking radiation. It's much stronger than the spontaneous, but it's not a single mode, so we call this multi-mode stimulated Hawking radiation. Um, and here we could put it on this, this graph. So here's the prediction, ha predicted Hawking temperature, the blue circles. In the multi-mode stimulated Hawking radiation, the quantity of Hawking radiation is much greater than, the, um, than expected for spontaneous Hawking radiation. And the width of the spectrum is even staying constant or even coming down a little bit. So now we can go to even later times, this last row. Um, and here we, we, we call it monochromatic stimulated Hawking radiation. So here's the multi-mode. Here's even later times. We see now we do have this um, sort of monochromatic pattern in our stimulated Hawking radiation. It's, it's becoming one mode, and it's become very, very strong. We have, here you can see the scale is 0.1, and here the scale is 2. So we have this very strong stimulated Hawking, monochromatic stimulated Hawking radiation. And we could take the Fourier transform of this, of this pattern, just to see that it's monochromatic. And so you have a, here a... Um, this is the Fourier transform, and you see this spot. That's the, the, that's the monochromatic uh, mode. And we, these blue circles are the prediction from that second mechanism where we had the um, waves produced at the inner horizon, and they come out and get a Doppler shift and, or, and hit the outer horizon. 
that mechanism would predict these blue points for the, um, for the 2D4A transform. This is K and K. So, um, so we would predict the blue circles and we see that the measurement is pretty close to the blue circles. So uh, we think that this is the, really the description of what's happening in our stimulated Hawking radiation, is that these waves are produced at the inner horizon and come out and hit the outer horizon. So um, we could also look, do profiles. So we could integrate, oops, we could integrate along this direction. Uh, or, sorry, we could integrate along the length of the of the of um, of the correlation band and get the profile in this direction, the um, cross section of these um, correlation bands. And in the spontaneous period, you have this single minimum. In the multimode period, you have these ever deepening um, single minima in the profile and the correlations. And then it becomes sinusoidal and extremely so strong in the monochromatic period. So um, in conclusion, the Hawking radiation during the spontaneous period is seen to be spontaneous, thermal, at the correct temperature, and stationary. We have six independent measurements of the Hawking radiation in the spontaneous period. And thus, the semi-classical regime has been verified in an analog black hole, which confirms Hawking's calculation. Furthermore, we see stimulated Hawking radiation at later times. So what are the implications of this for real gravity? So my reason for wanting to study analog black holes is to learn something about real black holes. Well, firstly, the thermality of the Hawking radiation is the basis for the information paradox. So um, the fact that we see that the Hawking radiation in the semi-classical approximation is indeed thermal implies that there really is an information paradox which someone needs to solve by some other some other means. Um, for, second of all, the temperature links Hawking radiation with black hole entropy. So the Hawking temperature, which we see, is the same Hawking temperature predicted by Bekenstein by considerations of entropy. So we, 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 uh, we see that, that uh, the temperature really is relevant. Um, furthermore, now getting down to the subject, starting to get on the subject of, of quantum gravity, we see that the correlations between the Hawking and partner modes are of the predicted magnitude with no reduction due to the underlying quantum structure. So our analog black hole has an underlying quantum structure, like an analog quantum gravity. Specifically, it's made of, um, of, of atoms. And that, those are, that's our quantum gravity, as Stefano Liberati discussed yesterday. So, um, so we, but we see that this underlying quantum structure in no way disturbs our correlations between the Hawking and partner modes. So in other words, we have no analog firewall in our system. There's no firewall which is breaking our, our, um, our correlations. Now, you might say, well, an analog black hole doesn't have a firewall. But um, the discussion of a firewall in a real black hole um, centers on if a firewall is allowed or if a firewall is required, but there's been no mechanism proposed for how a firewall works microscopically. So um, if someone in the future will have a, a model of, of quantum gravity, real quantum gravity, where they'll exp they suggest how a firewall really works, then they should, could check their theory um, to check that our black, our analog black hole doesn't have that mechanism because we don't see the, um, um, so because we don't see a firewall behavior. So you can say um, this could possibly be a hint in the future for people checking their um, want to, that want to check their quantum gravity theory. So um, this, so now I'd like to move on to what what could be done in the future. Well, I think that there are um, many researchers in the field of analog, gra of analog gravity are starting, thinking, are starting thinking about going beyond the semi-classical approximation, as Stefano Liberati discussed yesterday. So, um, and I, I would like us to somehow get some information regarding quantum gravity, if possible. So we have the subject of analog black holes, and here's the subject of quantum gravity. One possibility would be to start with quantum gravity and try to move towards an analog system. So the question would be, 
could quantum gravity models be tested in some type of analog system? So people who work on quantum gravity, maybe you can think about something about your model, which could be, which is model independent and could be tested in an analog system. And so we would love to hear any proposals that you might have. Now, I would also like to briefly mention the Large Hadron Collider. At the LHC, they are searching for semi-classical and quantum black holes. There are many papers discussing their searches. Um, a quantum black hole is a black hole which is so small that it should be dominated by quantum gravity, its behavior. So they could study, if they could find these black holes, they could study them and study the Hawking radiation and see the effect of quantum gravity. Also, from analog, the analog black hole perspective, um, how could we somehow get some information about quantum gravity? Um, well, I would like to now mention what, what kind of questions can we answer? We would like real quantum gravity to definitively answer the following questions. We being me and some other subset of people, of the people. So um, we would like quantum gravity to answer what is the role of quantum gravity in the information paradox? We'd like a definitive answer to this question. And the related question, how does quantum gravity affect Hawking radiation? So I, I propose that we first answer an easier question. How does analog gravity affect Hawking radiation in an analog black hole? So to completely understand the analog of quantum gravity, um, in the analog black hole. Um, so in, the, in our analog black hole, we have a semi-classical approximation. And which means that what, we, what my work has so far been based really on the, in the semi-classical limit. Our system um, that I discussed today is very much in the limit where you could neglect anything beyond the semi-classical approximation. So in the semi-classical approximation, we partially ignore the underlying quantum structure, the atomic structure. We assume that the Bose-Einstein condensate is smooth and governed by the gross pitayevsky equation. That's a smooth background. We compute the spectrum of linear excitations. We use, then use the quantum field theory. Now, um, that's the semi-classical approximation. Now, the simulations that we have at our disposal for, for an analog black hole are only valid in the semi-classical approximation. They're only valid when the fluctuations are, are very small. The fluctuations on the background are small. So if we want to go to analog um, quantum gravity, it would be nice to answer the questions, what is the back reaction of the phonons onto the analog black hole? And what is the effect of phonon-phonon interactions on the Hawking radiation? In the semi-classical approximation, the phonons don't interact. So um, we could increase the interactions. In order to achieve this, we could inter increase the interactions between particles. And this will increase these effects. This will increase the, the, the back reaction as well as the phonon-phonon -phonon interactions. So on the theoretical side, um, we need analytical studies to make, to make predictions of what to answer these two questions. And Stefano Liberati basically yesterday gave us sort of a an example of an analytical study where he explained to us that the correlations, that the um, outgoing Hawking radiation is somewhat correlated with the, the background, with the underlying um, quantum, the underlying space-time particles. Now, this, um, so if there's enhanced, if, so if there's some correlation between the Hawking radiation and the, um, and the underlying quantum structure, that would, it seems to me, would leave less um, possibility for less correlations available, less entanglement available between the outgoing Hawking radiation and the infalling Hawking radiation. So in a sense, he predicted a, a type of sort of firewall behavior, I think, that um, there's some breaking of the, um, of the correlations between the outgoing Hawking radiation and the, and the infalling Hawking radiation. So, so that's one example of a theoretical study, and we can here. Here again is the correlation function. I didn't mention this. This uh, this is the average of all of the six correlation functions in the spontaneous period. So perhaps Stefano Liberati is, is predicting that this band here should get a little bit weaker. 
breaking some of those correlations between the inside and outside of the black hole due to the correlations of the Hawking radiation with the, uh, with, with the underlying quantum background. However, that's, uh, uh, that should, of course, be checked carefully. But so, um, so analytical studies are needed to make predictions. Also, new simulation techniques are needed to, to um, allow to, for the study of, of, these, of the large amplitude fluctuations to see the back reaction and the phonon-phonon -phonon interactions. From the experimental side, um, we could study strongly interacting condensates. So we, in order to um, bring these, these effects of the back reaction and the phonon-phonon -phonon interactions up to a, some observable level, we should, we should increase the interactions in our condensate. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Questions? Um, I have one comment. Uh, I think that your inner horizon more than be like a charged black hole inner horizon, which would be also a Cauchy horizon, so unstable even at the relativistic theory is more similar to the inner horizon of a regular black hole. You know, one of the possible ways in which people have tried to solve the information loss problem is that you don't form the singularity. But basically, the graph that I showed yesterday is, is, is wrong, that um, you have a basically Minkowski space and just uh, a trapped region. In order for the trapped region to be compact and close up, you need an inner horizon to form. So in a slant sense, uh, your rays are growing to, uh, toward the singularity, but then you have to refocus the Again, and that it would be the, your inner horizon. So in a regular configuration like you have without a, a singularity, basically it's normal that you need to form at some point the inner horizon. Mm -hmm. So it's very nice that you see all the effects that were predicted in relation to that as well. Um, so first, uh, this is, is my first comment. The second comment is that in a certain sense, the argument I was trying to make yesterday is that uh, there is no need of a firewall exactly because of this extra correlation that are produce automatically at all times. Of course, they are much more relevant at the end of the evaporation, but they are produced at all times between the Hawking quantum and the substratum. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there is a kind of conservation of correlation so that the total sum of correlation, I mean, it's, this is something we need to check. If uh, this extra correlation with the substratum implies that there is, because you see, um, if you consider the substratum classical, you still get the standard squeeze state of the Hawking radiation in my. So, I, but I definitely uh, agree with you that there is something interesting to see there about the mechanism and the, with which information has to be preserved on the condensate, of course. Yes. So, um, yeah, I agree with what you said. I, yeah, I wasn't implying that you were saying that there's, it's a matter of uh, terminology if what you said proves there is no firewall or itself is a firewall. It, it breaks the correlations, you, as you say. So you don't need a firewall because you've broken the correlations by a different mechanism. That sounds reasonable. Thank you. So I'm a little confused about the, by the computation of the analog of the surface gravity, because if for a real black hole, that's a fairly regular quantity. You're just taking the limit of a certain quantity close to the horizon. Whereas here, it seems to me you're sort of trying to take a derivative close to a step function. So isn't there some ambiguity there? Okay. Um, you can say the surface gravity in a real black hole gives some, says something about the curvature of the, of the metric. You can say it says something about the diameter of the black hole. And here also you have, um, you have this slope. The steeper the slope, it's sort of like a smaller black hole. You could say the steeper it gets, the smaller the black hole. So you, you, by taking these derivatives, you're calculating a length scale, basically. So it's similar. Yeah, no, my, my, I understand, but my confusion is that uh, those, those derivatives look, look really sort of uh, uh, singular, right, at where you're trying to compute them. So isn't there some... It's not singular. It's, okay. it's, not, it's actually longer, significantly longer than the healing length. Okay. So it's, act, okay. uh, it's just that the whole black hole is big, so the derivative looks okay. deep, I would say. Thank you. I mean, it's exactly the peeling surface gravity. You know, for Hawking radiation, 
uh, it's not, I mean, it's, it's just, um, often it's, it's thought that the, the surface gravity which is relevant is the infinity of the horizon because one thinks about the event horizon. If you have a dynamical situation like here, what is important is in your geometry what determines the peeling of the null rays, right? And that peeling, the peeling away from the horizon close to the horizon is ruled by an exponential which has a, a factor kappa. That factor kappa is the one uh, that appears in that formula. And the step is just the potential, but the flow of the, the velocity is not a step function, of course. It's much, uh, okay. it's, uh, it's more like an hyperbolic tangent, something that has a, uh, a definite slope. Uh, my question is uh, uh, whether you can, uh, you could in principle borrow some uh, of the techniques uh, used uh, for out of equilibrium, um, the, stu the study of out of equilibrium phenomena in um, quantum gases uh, to have a more direct uh, measurement of the degree of entanglement between the particles and maybe also the entropy as a function of time. Okay, um, in one of our previous papers, we discussed, we saw the entanglement between the particles. And uh, we developed a technique where we could uh, measure it from the very, this very correlation function actually has the information of the entanglement built in, you could say. Basically, um, there's a, there's a, 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 a there's a relation which says that if the correlations are strong enough, they cannot be classical. It must be a, a non-separable state. And so we, che we check if the correlations are indeed strong enough. And we find that, so we, we, we measure the entanglement that way. But did you, yeah. uh, did, you, uh, did you do it also for these various um, uh, for these various parts of the dynamics? Uh, no, we didn't do that. Only for the the older experiment. Um, yes, here, here we in sense have a, another technique. We, we show that the spontane, um, the Hawking radiation is spontaneous by the quantity of the Hawking radiation that agrees precisely with what one would expect for the spontaneous case, and the spontaneous has to be uh, a quantum. I suggest we postpone any further question to the later discussion. Let's thank the speaker again. Next speaker is Alberto Nicolis. Oh, I know where that is. Yeah, you know okay. where the building is, the physics department, just opposite this building. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. and, okay. Okay. And okay. all that spam, just give me a ring. Okay, okay, thanks, bye. Thanks. Okay, next speaker is Alberto Nicolis, who will speak about effective field theories for phases of matter. Thank you very much, William. Mike. You have some? Oh, yeah, okay. Stole the microphone. Okay. Stole. I didn't get very far. You can keep talking. I just pointed at the slides. Does it work? Yes? Okay, thanks very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. Let me take care of this. So, uh, I want to summarize, how much do I have, 45 minutes? I want to summarize some work uh, I've been doing with uh, many people, some of whom are here at the conference, over the last few years um, about uh, uh, general effective field theory uh, ideology and uh, techniques applied to um, what we call condensed matter, by which we mean uh, phases of matter that uh, break certain space-time symmetries, in particular Lorentz, 
And uh, so in particular, hydrodynamics from this viewpoint qualifies as condensed matter. So it's perhaps an unconventional definition, but we will see why it's a useful one. So uh, we uh, base our uh, approach uh, on uh, heavily on symmetries, and we know that symmetries are very useful. Symmetry considerations are very useful in physics in general. Okay. And uh, a symmetry is a transformation of the dynamical variables of a system that uh, somehow uh, leaves the dynamic, dynamics invariant. And uh, uh, in particular, we usually talk about discrete symmetries or continuous symmetries. Uh, for what I'm going to talk about, uh, I emphasize the role of continuous symmetries. So we'll not talk about discrete symmetries. I will focus on continuous symmetries. And uh, we know that there are two um, fundamental theorems that have to do with the continuous symmetries. One is Nether's theorem, and the other is Goldstone's theorem. Nether's theorem we are all familiar with. It's the statement that continuous symmetries are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the conservation laws, and the implications bo go both ways. If I have a continuous symmetry, I have an associated conservation law. If I have a conserved quantity, I can use it, for instance, in the Hamiltonian formulation to generate a symmetry. So there's really an equivalence between uh, continuous symmetries and non-trivial conservation laws. And uh, the prime examples are, of course, the standard conservation of energy, momentum, angular momentum that are associated with time translations, spatial translations, and spatial rotations. But uh, we are also used to more uh, exotic symmetries, like internal symmetries that act on fields and not on coordinates. And, uh, um, and uh, those are those have associated conservation laws as well, for instance, baryon number conservation. Now, uh, in fact, for what I want to talk about, the other theorem is more relevant. It's the Goldstone theorem that says that if a symmetry is uh, uh, a symmetry of the dynamics, but somehow the system is in a state that breaks that symmetry, and this state could be the ground state, and that's the standard uh, declination of the Goldstone theorem, but it could, also, it could also be a more general state, more general state that breaks a symmetry, then the claim is that there are gapless excitations. And this has uh, implications both at the classical and the quantum level. Uh, if the dynamics are mostly classical, for instance, hydrodynamics, we usually think uh, of hydrodynamics as some sort of semi-classical limit of a quantum system, then gapless means that they really have uh, arbitrary low frequency. Typically, when I take wavelengths to infinity, the frequency of the corresponding excitations go to zero. And uh, if I'm talking about a real quantum system where quantum mechanics is important, then I really mean that these are zero energy excitations. So the energy of these excitations go to zero, for instance, when I take a wavelength, wavelength to zero. And uh, so, uh, and the Goldstone theorem, uh, or at least the Goldstone phenomenon and the Goldstone ideology, uh, not only tells us about the existence of gapless modes, it also tells us that their dynamics, their interactions are strongly constrained by symmetry considerations. And so, just to uh, give you an ex a, a basic mechanics example of how you could use considerations like this, let me talk about a long string, by which I don't mean a super string, I really mean some material, like violin string, okay, with some tension. And uh, uh, this is a mechanical system, it's a continuous mechanical system, and uh, uh, if, uh, if I think about how many symmetries it breaks, the state in which the string is straight in one direction, let's say the z direction, okay, well, it certainly breaks uh, translations in the horizontal direction, let's say x, okay? And so the Goldstone theorem, or the Goldstone ideology, would tell us that there is a gapless excitation, which I can parameterize as perturbations of the shape of the string in the x direction as a function of z and time. So this curve, the string I'm plotting here, okay? And uh, uh, not only does it break translations, the, the, the ground state of this string, the, the state in which this is elongated along z, it, only breaks, it also breaks Galilean boosts, which are a symmetry of the dynamics, taking the normal relativistic limit for now. And uh, uh, it also breaks rotations in the xz plane, okay? For infinitesimal transformations, all these symmetries act like this on my dynamical variable. Now, if you insist 
that the dynamics, even though the state of the system breaks these symmetries, the dynamics should be invariant under these symmetries, you can write down the most general action for this dynamical field compatible with those symmetries. And uh, uh, after you play uh, a bit to understand how to construct invariants, it turns out that to lowest order in derivatives, and I will comment what I mean by that, the most general action takes this form. There is a, going to be a kinetic energy, and the coefficient in front can be identified with the linear mass density of the string. By the way, I'm dropping factors of one half, pi, etc. Okay, I'm just doing somehow dimensional analysis in a sense. And then there's going to be this square root structure here, which if you think about it, is nothing but the actual length of the string in a perturbed state. Okay, so this is the sort of the infinitesimal length element integrated along z. And the, the coefficient in front can be identified with two tension. And then there are other terms, which I'm talking about finite size corrections, which have to do with the fact that this is the most general action in the limit in which the string has zero thickness. Okay? When I take into account now the fact that any material string will have a finite thickness, I can organize corrections to the, this action in powers of the thickness times further, for instance, z derivatives of the uh, dynamical field. By dimensional analysis, these two things should go together. Okay? So in the limit in which the wavelength that I'm considering, so the gradients along z are going to be very small, so the wavelength is going to be very long, these finite size effects can be neglected. And so this is the most general action to lowest order in derivatives. And from here, now if you take the equations of motion, for instance, you can derive the dispersion law for waves that propagate around the string, which is the standard one that you derive simply from a Newtonian analysis. But here it's derived purely in terms of symmetries. But you see that this action also gives you something more. It gives you, again, to lowest order in derivatives, it gives you all the interactions, meaning all the nonlinearities, because this complicated square root structure tells you now how these waves will interact when I have more than one. So this is, if you want, a prototypical effective theory for the gapless excitation, the Goldstone boson, that in this case is simply the displacement of the string. <laughs> And so if you try to generalize this idea now to more general uh, situations, you can use the, 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 the technology of effective field theory that has been studied to uh, death in uh, particle physics. Okay? And the idea is that you should uh, identify what the light degrees of freedom are. And by light, I mean those that survive at low energies or low frequencies. You should identify all the symmetries acting on them that I write here as a generic functional of the degrees of freedom because these symmetries could be, and in general are, nonlinear functionals, especially when I have spontaneously broken symmetries. They act on the Goldstone fields in a nonlinear fashion. <laughs> and then I should organize the dynamics in terms of an action or a Lagrangian that is the most general function of the fields and their derivatives. So this is a, a, an incredibly general, incredibly complicated object. However, what simplifies life a lot is that it should be organized as a derivative expansion in the sense that the idea is that uh, uh, there's going to be some microphysics responsible, for instance, for the spontaneous breaking of the symmetries you are talking about. And uh, at scales above the scale at which the microphysics is relevant, so for derivatives that are smaller than some uh, inverse UV scale and uh, uh, for time derivatives that are smaller than some uh, uh, UV frequency, uh, only a finite terms in this infinite power series expansion will survive and dominate the physics at low energy. So the prime example of this in particle physics is the pion. The pion is a complicated bound state of quarks and gluons for which Whose, whose internal structure we cannot solve for, okay? It's too complicated. However, because of symmetry considerations, in particular because it's a pseudo Goldstone boson, we know that uh, uh, at low energies it's weakly coupled, okay? So at long wavelengths and low energies it's a weakly coupled asymptotic state, QCD. And uh, uh, we can write down an effective field theory that describes its interactions with good accuracy. Again, which is valid, this effective field theory will be valid only at low frequencies and at long wavelengths. And so what we've been trying to do is to apply the same logic also to condensed matter, by, me, by which I mean states of matter that are sort of 
approximately at least homogeneous and isotropic perhaps at large distances, but they do break certain symmetries. In particular, they always break boosts. Okay? And it turns out that it's an extremely powerful tool and very general, and because the dynamics are mostly constrained by symmetry considerations up to a few free parameters. And uh, according to this philosophy, by the way, you also uh, can uh, think of cosmology, in particular cosmological perturbation theory, which is important for uh, observations. You can think of cosmological perturbation theory essentially as the same thing as doing what I've been telling you for condensed matter and then coupling to gravity. The, the idea behind this equality, and I assume that Riccardo Rattazzi will also mention something about this, is that uh, the symmetries that we are considering in the two cases are exactly the same because a cosmological expansion uh, has to do with uh, a universe that at least a very large scale is essentially homogeneous and isotropic. However, the state that the, this uh, fluid or medium is in breaks certainly boosts. There is a preferred reference frame in cosmology. In particular, there is also some time evolution, so also the time evolution certainly breaks boosts because it picks the direction of time. And these are exactly the symmetries that have been trying to emphasize for condensed matter. It's a, a condensed matter is a state of matter that breaks boosts. Any condensed matter system has a, referred, a, pre, a, pre, a preferred reference frame but uh, at, uh, at least large scales is homogeneous, perhaps isotrophic, unless you, know, unless you consider, I don't know, crystals, for instance. And so the symmetries on these two sides are exactly the same, and since effective field theory constructs everything starting from symmetry considerations, the same techniques and the same effect results and the same Lagrangians can be applied to both sides here. So I will not talk about cosmology in my talk, but uh, we've been applying these ideas to cosmology as well. So, uh, so the first example of an effective field theory of the sort I want to be talking about is hydrodynamics itself. Okay? So in hydrodynamics, well, you can, first of all, see the similarity between these two pictures. They are exactly the same picture, I only changed the interior. Okay? That's the effective field theory philosophy. Some things don't matter of what happens at very short distances. Okay? You can just consider what happens at long distances. So hydrodynamics, consider, for instance, a, a weakly coupled gas. Okay. Uh, at very short distances, interactions are negligible. Uh, there's essentially free stimulus of particles. Okay. However, as long as the interactions are not exactly zero, at any finite density, there's going to be a critical scale, the mean free path, beyond which you cannot neglect interactions anymore. The mean free path is defined by the average distance that the particle has to travel before having an interaction. Okay? So by definition, the probability of having one interaction in a, uh, one mean free path is one. Okay? So beyond this scale, you cannot uh, neglect interactions anymore. And uh, uh, fortunately, it turns out that uh, at much larger scales than the mean free path, there is uh, Another weakly coupled description, which has nothing to do with the microscopic description, okay? It's a, 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 a weakly coupled description in terms of hydrodynamical modes, in particular sound waves and vortices, okay? And uh, uh, so one can try, so this has been studied, of course, in great detail over centuries at the level of equations of motion and conservation laws, okay? One can also try to uh, understand this from the viewpoint of effective actions, effective theories. Okay? So let me just mention briefly how one would construct the effective theory from the viewpoint really of field theory and the actions for field theories for solids and fluids, because it turns out that uh, from this viewpoint, the viewpoint of symmetries and Lagrangian, solids and fluids are essentially the same thing, with the only difference that a fluid happens to be a very symmetric solid. In a, sense that I will make precise in a second. So how do we describe the, now the, I just want to talk about the mechanical deformations, about the geometric deformations of a medium like a solid of a fluid. Well, we have our medium, which could be deformed and we could be moving. We can erect a system of coordinates that lives in the medium and is co-moving with the medium. So if the medium gets deformed, these axes get deformed. If the medium moves, these axes move, okay? And then we have our fixed reference frame in the lab, x1, x2, x3. And uh, uh, 
the mechanical or geometric degrees of freedom of the medium are simply the mapping between the internal coordinates and the spatial coordinates as a function of time. Okay. So notice that I'm, uh, I'm choosing to parameterize, if you want, the configuration of space of the medium by giving you the co-moving coordinates as functions of x and t. I could do the opposite. I could, do, I could give you the uh, physical coordinates as functions of co-moving coordinates and time. Okay, at fixed time, the mapping is invertible. So these two are uh, equivalent pictures. For hydrodynamics, they correspond to the uh, Eulerian versus Lagrangian viewpoint. Okay? They are equivalent, however, I prefer this one because now, you see, X and T transform under space-time symmetries in the usual ways. In particular, if I want to do relativistic uh, hydrodynamics, and I'm going to do that because I find it simpler technically, and then one can take the non-relativistic limit at any point. So if I want to do relativistic hydrodynamics, X and T transform as a four-vector under Poincaré symmetries, whereas these phi i's, which are internal labels, for the medium volume elements transform as scalar fields. So from this viewpoint, hydrodynamics, or even the effective theory of the geometric deformations of a solid, is just a theory of scalar fields. And it's three scalar fields. And I have to figure out the symmetries. And the hint about the symmetries, apart from Poincaré, which should be there, comes from the fact that I want probably this coordinate system to be such that in a very simple state, in particular for the state at equilibrium for this medium, let's say at some given external pressure, I want these coordinates to be aligned with the physical coordinates. I could choose other coordinate systems, but this is, of course, one that is very convenient because it simplifies life a lot. So I want that at equilibrium, the expectation values of these fields be the spatial coordinates. Now, this apparently breaks, uh, these expectation values break translations and rotations. But uh, uh, if we want to describe a medium that at least at large distances is homogeneous and isotropic for simplicity, then uh, this breaking must be fake. So it means that it must be made up for by certain internal symmetries on the fields, in particular internal translations on the fields and internal rotations of the fields, so that these equilibrium expectation values preserve a linear combination of internal and spatial translations and internal and spatial rotations. And uh, uh, okay, now what distinguishes a solid from a fluid from this viewpoint is that a fluid, in fact, has dynamics that are invariant under a much bigger symmetry, volume preserving internal diffeomorphisms on the co moving coordinates. This is essentially the statement that uh, if I take a fluid, let's say in its uh, equilibrium state at some finite pressure, and then I start moving things adiabatically around, the energy does not change. Whereas if I try to move things adiabatically around for a solid, there are transverse stresses that want to bring back the volume elements to the rest position. So this, is this physical property of fluids is encapsulated in an infinite dimensional symmetry. If I move volume elements around in an arbitrary way without ever compressing them or dilating them, so that's why it should be a volume preserving diff, the dynamics should be invariant. So given these ingredients, writing down the effective action for solids and fluids is trivial. One writes down the most general, the most general function of this particular object. It turns out that this is invariant under internal shifts and Poincaré. And the only requirement now on the IJ indices is that they should obey these symmetries. So if I want to describe some isotropic solid, I should contract I and J in some SO3 invariant way. For instance, traces, determinants are all good. Whereas if I want a fluid, I should further take a function of this matrix that is invariant under volume preserving diffeomorphisms. And this turns out to be the determinant. Okay? These are general functions. At, uh, at this level. However, uh, if one wants to map this to uh, any given fluid, okay, then uh, one can, could fix this function uh, in terms of the equation of state. For instance, once I know the action, I can derive the stress energy tensor as the network current for space time translations or by coupling this to gravity and checking what the, what's the tensor that couples to the fluctuations of the gravitational field. And by the stress energy tensor, once I know the stress energy tensor now, then I can extract uh, the, the energy density and the pressure in terms of this function f, 
So if I know the equation of state of the fluid I want to describe, that gives me an algebraic relation between energy and pressure, okay? And then I can invert that relationship at determining F. So this F is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the equation of state. And one can use these uh, uh, effective actions to compute a number of physical properties, okay? And the physical, physical uh, also to, to understand certain physical phenomena. Let me, perhaps, instead of doing this here, let me do this uh, for another system, in particular vortex lines in uh, superfluids. So what's the, what's the difference between uh, an ordinary fluid and uh, a, a zero temperature superfluid? Well, at the level of equations of motion, there's not much difference. They both obey hydrodynamical equations of motion. However, when, when, one's look, when, sorry, when one looks at the spectrum of transverse excitations, <clears throat> In, a, in an ordinary fluid, one can have very general vortex configurations. In particular, they can be, let me say, arbitrarily soft, in the sense that they can have a vortex configuration in an ordinary fluid and can have arbitrarily mild gradients, and uh, the velocity field can be as arbitrarily slow. So in particular, the energy of a vortex configuration can go continuously to zero. Whereas in a superfluid, since I know that uh, in the back of the superfluid, the, the velocity field should be rotational, irrotational, a vortex configuration can only be a singular object from the viewpoint of the hydro hydrodynamical description of a, of a superfluid. It has to be uh, a line-like defect. It's a topological defect. In particular, vorticity is localized on the defect. On the defect, the effective field theory of the superfluid breaks down. Okay, and uh, uh, correspondingly, there's a gap. The, 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 the vortex configuration for a superfluid has a finite energy per unit length. In fact, that energy per unit length is logarithmically divergent, both in the UV and in the IR, and we will see with what that means. And, uh, uh, okay, however, it's a particularly nice to focus on line-like Vortex, vortices like this, compared to much more general vortices in ordinary fluids, because at least one can track the evolution of the vortex very uh, directly, in the sense that if you follow what the line does, you know, by some sort of Biot-Savart law, which we will see in a second, what the velocity field is everywhere else. Whereas here, if I want to give you the vortex, the, 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 if you want to understand what, what a vo more general vortex in hydrodynamics is doing, you really have to monitor a fully three-dimensional velocity field. So for the purposes of visualization and understanding what a vortex does, it's much easier to focus on vortex lines because the line, where the line is and what the shape does tells you everything. And in fact, line-like vortices can exist also in ordinary fluids. The only difference is that in superfluids, the properties of the line are completely determined. The, the, the physical parameters that, that tell you what uh, the energy of the line is, etc., are completely determined by the microphysics. In particular, for helium-4, the thickness of a vortex line is atomic size, essentially. Whereas uh, uh, in an ordinary fluid, it's a free parameter. You can come up with line-like uh, vortices that have arbitrary thicknesses, as we will see. Now, the evolution of vortex lines <clears throat> is notoriously difficult to figure out using standard methods. The reason, uh, there are a number of reasons, but uh, perhaps the reason is uh, obvious if you think about a magnetostatic analogy, okay? So let's work in the incompressible limit. In the incompressible limit, uh, the velocity field is uh, divergence-free. And the vorticity, by definition, is uh, the curl of the velocity field. And I'm telling you that uh, a vortex line is defined as being a vortex whose vorticity is localized on this line, okay? So now I can think of uh, the velocity as a magnetic field, because it's divergence-free, and I can think of the vorticity as the current generating that magnetic field, okay? So I have a situation, in, using this analogy, I have a situation in which I have a current localized on a wire. So I have a current flowing in a wire, okay? And we know what the magnetic field looks like. It's exactly these circles, okay? And in particular, if I give you the shape of the wire and the total current flowing in it, which is just the circulation of the magnetic field, okay? So it's this <laughs> parameter gamma. 
Then I know the magnetic field everywhere else by the Biot-Savart law, which is this expression. So now if I want to rephrase everything in terms of the physical quantities I'm interested in, the velocity field in particular, if I know the shape of the line, if I know the shape of the line where vorticity is uh, concentrated, and I know how much uh, current there is in it, this gamma, then the velocity field everywhere else takes this form. Okay? Now it so happens, because of Kelvin's theorem, which is one of the fundamental theorems in hydrodynamics, it so happens that if I extrapolate this velocity field down to the position of the line itself, this gives me the instantaneous position of the line, the instantaneous velocity of the line. Meaning the, li the claim is that Kelvin's theorem tells you that this line will be moving with the local velocity of the surrounding flow. Okay? So the, the, essentially the line is dragged by the flow. So not only the line generates some flow, but it's also dragged by it. Now, if I have a straight line, of course everything is trivial, but the moment the line is curved, this velocity field is very non-trivial, and the line will respond to this velocity field itself. So this, if you want, is an equation of motion for the line itself. And it's a first order equation of motion. So it's not of the form F equals MA. So we have, I personally have very little intuition about first order equations of motion. Okay? Second, it's an integral differential equation of motion. I have the time derivative of the position is given by an integral along the line. So solving these equations of, equations of motion like this, if I have, let's say, a number of lines, a number of curves, is, uh, uh, is very complicated. Both we have very little intuition about it. B, it's technically complicated because they are integral differential equations of motion. Perhaps a, 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 the simplest application of this equation of motion is the study of small perturbations of a straight line. So if I have a straight line and I perturb it a bit, there is a spectrum of oscillations which go under the name of Kelvin waves. Okay? They were derived by Lord Kelvin in 1880, not in superfluids, of course, but in an ordinary, in ordinary liquids. And... Uh, uh, the, yeah, if you look at this paper, the computation is extremely painful to follow, also because the notation back then was totally different, so you don't even understand what he's talking about. But there is the final result, it's a very long computation, and uh, uh, it, it takes a, a cylindrical vortex slightly perturbed, okay? And uh, it derives that uh, in the long wavelength limit, compared to the thickness of the cylinder, uh, the spectrum of excitations looks like this. So first of all, I have two modes overall, which is different from 2 plus 2. What I mean is that I have only one mode going up and only one mode going down. I don't have two polarizations going up and two polarizations going down. They are, they are both circularly polarized, and since I only have one going up and one going down, I cannot take linear combinations to make them linearly polarized. They are only circularly polarized. And... Uh, and uh, uh, they have this uh, non-local dispersion relation, meaning it's, uh, the, the dispersion relation is not particularly regular at k equals zero. Okay, now, sorry, I keep banging into this sculpture. Uh, now, um, from a field theory viewpoint, when we see this, and when we see, so when we see an integral like this, and when we see a a dispersion relation that is not regular for k going to zero, that's a hint uh, or almost a proof that uh, we're not keeping track of all the degrees of freedom, that something has been secretly integrated out to arrive at these expressions. Okay? And we will see in a bit what those extra degrees of freedom are. In particular, we will interpret this dispersion relation in the language of RG running. Let me show you some videos. Okay, so these are real vortex lines, in particular vortex rings, so when I close one of these lines into a ring, uh, in water, and you see, you see some little white bubbles here, so these are, uh, these are uh, air bubbles, microscopic air bubbles that are, that are used as tracers, because these are vortices in water. If you don't use a tracer, you don't see anything, because it's water in water. So these air bubbles will, get, will be dragged with the vortex, and eventually they float to the locus where pressure is minimized, which happens to be 
the core of the vortex. So these tracers will really follow the core of the vortex. So the first video up here, they are just pushing water through this hole, and that creates a vortex, as you see, and then eventually the air bubbles float to the core, and so that's the core of the vortex. Now, in this video here, which I'm going to start in a second, so this is a shape, this is a 3D shape that they printed out with. This, by the way, these experiments are done at the University of Chicago by this person, William Irvine, uh, who, despite the name, happens to be from L'Aquila. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and he, he, grew, he grew up there, so... <laughs> And uh, in, in, in L'Aquila. Anyway, so he prints out, he told me that they have zero, intu because of those first order equations of motion, they have zero intuition about how to do these things. They just print out with a 3D printer shapes, they try them, and if they form, a, they, 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 they do something interesting, they keep them. Okay. So, and so this is a shape, this is some sort of the trifoil shape, and they're going to pull it down, and this will leave behind a perturbed vortex ring. However, since I told you that uh, there's only circularly polarized waves on a vortex line, and also in particular on a vortex ring, you will see that even though the initial conditions are totally planar, the ring will go out of plane immediately because of the circular polarization. You see that it starts sort of, uh, these, are, these are really circularly polarized waves. And these, these are not simulations, these are real data, and they're fully three-dimensional because they scan the system, this vat of water with the very high frequency laser uh, tomography, and they collect fully three-dimensional data, and so then they can rotate the videos however they want. And th this is a, a vortex ring knotted onto itself, you see? And the other ones are vortex rings two vortex rings knotted onto each other. So I think they were, they were the first ones to produce topologically non-trivial vortex configurations in the lab. And uh, many of you already know that there are other groups playing with vortex rings, and they mean really playing. So apparently the species of dolphins, these, these are just dolphins at a water park. They're not trained to do these things, but somehow they, they, they they naturally play with vortex rings. I find it beautiful that uh, apparently they are much better than William Irvine at playing with them, in the sense that, <laughs> that, in the, sense that the, the, the things that they do are incredibly stable. As you can see, they live for tens of seconds, and they can even bite off smaller ones. And uh, you see? Yeah, it's amazing how they I think it's because, you see, they live in water, so they probably have intuition about first-order <laughs> equations of motion. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think that's the difference. Yeah, that, that, that's evolution. How to do that thing in the lab. <laughs> Which three? Ah, the biting off. I have no idea. <laughs> but I think that's, uh, that's just evolution. No, so. and, uh, wow. and they use the same technique, meaning they blow air out of their blowhole, and so they use, uh, what you see is just air as a tracer, but the whole dynamics is, is given by water, essentially. Anyway, you can find on YouTube infinitely many of these videos. By the way, I contacted at some point a guy uh, in, it, in Riccione, Leonardo Stanzani, who is a photographer and runs a water park with dolphins that also play with these things. And... Um, asking him whether the trainers could be trained the dolphins to do scattering experiments and stuff like that. <laughs> and he said they would get back to me, but he never got back to me. And then Ricardo told me that maybe he's in jail now. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you told me that someone, some, some, some Italian guy running a water park uh, went to jail because of mistreatment of dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so so let me do let me do the analysis for superfluids, which are cleaner because somehow they have fewer uh, degrees of freedom. So. Uh, a superfluid, so I want to now to describe this, instead of using this complicated uh, integral differential equations of motion, I want to describe this system using an effective field theory for the degrees of freedom 
of the vortex line and of the perturbations in the fluid. Let me do this for the superfluid because it's slightly cleaner. So for a superfluid, um, uh, so from the, view, from the viewpoint of quantum field theory, like, like Angelo Esposito was mentioning the other day, a superfluid can be thought of as a system with an internal U1 symmetry, conserved charge. Let's say for the liquid helium is uh, helium atom number is conserved. And uh, that charge is spontaneously broken. That's the quantum field theory Uh, uh, if you want, uh, interacting version of saying that there is Bose-Einstein condensation. Bose-Einstein condensation, okay, is well defined at uh, for a free theory or a very weak coupling, but for strongly interacting systems, we don't, we're not quite sure what that means. However, we can replace that with the spontaneous breaking of a charge, which is uh, defined at uh, all values of a coupling constant. And so there should be some light degrees of freedom, a Gauss-Tone boson. And, uh, but it's also a system that has a finite density for that spontaneously broken charge. So I have Bose-Einstein condensation only if I have some density around. If I have zero atoms around, I don't have Bose-Einstein condensation. So these two things are, in principle, two independent physical phenomena. A superfluid is a system that has both, okay? And so by playing a bit with the symmetries, the transformation laws of the fields, etc., one can prove that these light ghost on fields, which is related to the phase field of the superfluid, is the same, when, when we say that the superfluid is a finite density, it means that this phase field can be expanded about some background value, which is the chemical potential times time, plus perturbations. And these perturbations, pi, are the phonons. And then if you try to understand what are the symmetries acting on these fields, you carry down the most general action, again, as a derivative expansion, in terms of these fields. So this X is related to the derivatives of the field. Again, I'm doing the relativistic case because it's technically simpler to contract Lorentz indices in the usual way, but one can take the non-relativistic limit whenever one wants. And, uh, and the, again, there is a, there is a uh, generic function here, P, which I call P for the reason that once you figure out its relationship to the equation of state of the superfluid, there is really turns out to be the pressure expressed as a function of the chemical potential. So once you have the equation of state, you know the Lagrangian of the fields. From a, C, from a Lagrangian like this, you can start computing processes like Angelo was doing the other day. For instance, phonon, phonon scattering. By the way, related to this, uh, related to the first talk of today, I would say that if I have, now it depends on what you mean by going to strong, having a strongly coupled system, but I would say that at given phonon momentum, interactions for phonons are going to become weaker if the underlying system is more strongly coupled. In the sense that, uh, you see, for instance, a cross-section for phonons scale like, scales like uh, the speed of sound square at the denominator and the density square at the denominator. So I would say, for instance, for a, strong, for a more strongly coupled condensate, probably the speed of sound goes up. Right? Yes. It probably it's a matter of what we what you keep constant, no? We we can talk offline about this. But I'm saying that once you have the effective theory, you can really compute scattering processes between phonons, and so then it's really simple to check what you need to make interactions for phonons stronger. But the thing is that if you're weakly coupled then the free path becomes large and then you can talk about the Which makes interaction stronger. Yes. yes. The softer the thing, the stronger the interactions of the phone. The more they move the system, the stronger the interaction of the phone. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yes. But he mentioned about the interaction. But he wants to go up. No? Well, when I say stronger interacting, one day, yes. the more dilute is stronger interacting. Yes. Okay. <laughs> in 1D, um, more dilute means stronger interacting. No, but in no, any well, for the maybe. phonons, but he's talking about the, the microscopic uh, atoms. The, yeah. Sorry, the microscopic constituents. Well, it also depends on the range of the interactions. <clears throat> yeah. the yeah. Anyway, but, let's, but let's, but let's anyway, anyway, just, just since you raise the issue, uh, your Lagrangian and the systematic effective field theory construction is clearly giving you uh, it's clearly giving you a setup to compute 
<laughs> your, your setup uh, really is perfect for a systematic study of uh, the analog uh, Hawking radiation. Did anyone do it? My, ours. Ours. <laughs> sure, yours because you're there. I mean, <laughs> yes. Uh, ours, son. Uh, Damn son. son. Okay, okay yes. so. So did, it, did anyone do it? You just you simply have to couple yes. d mu phi to an external source j mu, which is localized at a point, and then you compute things to, to generate this water. Yeah, that you yeah exactly. About. Yeah. That's all you have that, to do. We can do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, one can use these Lagrangians to compute systematically things like this, and in particular now we can ask. I don't. I'm almost out of time. No. Five minutes, thank you. We can ask how we couple to the, uh, how we can couple to a defect now, okay? Now, a defect, by definition, is something where things go wrong for the effective field theory. In particular, here, the, this phase field is not single valued around the defect. So, to make, since I don't have much time, to make a, a long story short, what you have to use is some sort of uh, uh, magnetic dual of this field. It turns out to be a two-form field. You turn the crank, and then you can use perturbation theory. Uh, well, first, you write down the most general action coupling, for instance, these uh, bulk fields, in particular, this two-form field, which is the magnetic dual of phi to the, to the string. Turns out to be a calbramon type coupling, for those of you who know some string theory. And, uh, uh, and then you can start doing perturbation theory to compute things. And in particular, for instance, you can compute the self-energy of a string-like vortex. By stress self-energy, I really mean the uh, corrections to the, the contributions to the energy of a string coming from the interactions with the bulk modes. Okay? So in the language of Feynman diagrams, the string, in particular here, this is the worksheet of the string, the string can exchange bulk modes with itself, and this corrects its energy. And it turns out that uh, the correction to the energy that you get per unit length is logarithmically divergent. The prefactor is just a certain uh, combination of coupling constants, okay? And uh, it's logarithmically divergent both in the UV and in the IR. The UV divergence can be taken care of by usual renormalization of quantum field theory. The R divergence is more interesting because it uh, uh, tells you that uh, when this is a physical scale, it could be the container size, it could be the distance to the nearest string, it could be the wavelength of perturbations in a string. Okay? This logarithmic dependence on the IR scale is physical. In particular, you can phrase it if you introduce a, a tension term in the action, some sort of Nambugoto term, you can phrase it as a running, a, a, a renormalization group running of the tension of the string. That's precisely the log that we were finding in those other situations, for instance, in the spectrum of Kelvin waves, okay? And, uh, um, but this allows you, these, uh, these techniques allow you to go further. For instance, again, based on symmetries now, the full action for perturbations of the string to lowest order in uh, wavelengths, gradients of the perturbations, but to all orders in the size of the perturbation takes this form. We notice again the same square root structure that we saw on the first slide, but now with the running tension, okay? So this tension is really the energy per unit length of the string, which depends in particular of the wavelength of perturbations logarithmically. And you can find, for, you can look for nonlinear solutions. So remember, the Kelvin wave solution I told you about was a linearized solution. Now you can look for nonlinear solutions. We found this solution, which I don't think uh, it's uh, very easy to make in a lab, but we call it a self pipe. This solution is. Uh, so remember the. the Thank you. So remember, the, the, the Kelvin wave solutions are sort of uh, uh, small amplitude waves, circularly polarized. Okay? Now imagine keeping the wavelength very long, but making the amplitude very large. You end up with a solenoid-like structure. Now because there is uh, this uh, analogy with magnetostatics, you can really think of this as a solenoid. And remember, the, uh, magnet, the role of mag the magnetic field is played by the velocity field. So this is a configuration in which uh, the velocity field is zero outside, 
constant inside, so it's a self-sustained hydrodynamic pipe in which the fluid makes a pipe and it flows inside it. Okay. Uh, this should be there. Now, I don't know if we can make it experimentally, but perhaps numerically it can be verified. Uh, I should probably conclude. Let me conclude with this. This is a project we did uh, last year or a couple of years ago with Angelo Esposito and another student of mine, Rafael Krichevsky. So in uh, cold atom gases, there's a well-known phenomenon whereby if you have a trapped cloud, let's say with, a, with an approximately elliptical shape, and you have a vortex displaced of center, the vortex goes around, orbits the center, with a given frequency and, uh, and, uh, a, uh, and uh, an orbit which has essentially the same aspect ratio as the cloud, perhaps not surprising, okay? Now, computing this using, for instance, Gross-Pitayeski is quite demanding. In this language that I was describing to you, it turns out to, to be very simple. It is given by just two Feynman diagrams in which the string, remember this plane is the word sheet of the string, the string, the vortex, exchanges a phonon with the trapping potential. And one finds the precession frequently in terms of the trapping frequencies, the circulation, the speed of sound, and there is a logarithmic dependence on the size of the cloud, which was something that was established also by other means. I should probably conclude, so I'm going to skip uh, the helium-4 discussion. So I try to convince you that uh, uh, this language and ideas that comes from quantum field theory of spontaneously broken symmetries, Goldstone bosons, and effective field theory are very general concepts and very useful tools that can be applied to condensed matter and hydrodynamics as well. I didn't have time to tell you about cosmology, but again, the symmetries are pretty much the same, so we can apply the same techniques. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We have time for maybe at most one specific question, and otherwise I would discuss later. I would ask Alberto whether you can just sketch the cosmology part. Huh, uh, the sketch the cosmology part. D so I mean, uh, just to as a function for the general discussion later on. As a function for the general discussion. So cosmology. So, uh, can I play this? Just to, perhaps, just to motivate why all this is. For instance, let's think about inflation. Usually, we think about the early universe as some homogeneous and isotropic system, okay? And in particular, time translations, though, are broken because the system evolves with time, okay? So usually, one can model this with a set of matter fields, for instance, a scalar field that depends on time, coupled to gravity. However, one could think more directly in terms of Goldstone's theorem. Since time translations and the evolutions of the universe, so the evolution of the universe is time dependent, so time translations are spontaneously broken, there must be Goldstone excitations associated with the spontaneous breaking. And uh, if one thinks really about how they transform under the space-time symmetries in the context of cosmology, one can identify them with the so-called adiabatic perturbations of cosmology, which are those that we observed, for instance, in the CMB that we take as evidence for inflation itself. And so one can construct a systematic effective field theory based on these ideas. In particular, this is very reminiscent of the superfluid effective field theory I just gave you. And one can use this effective field theory to compute correlation functions of the temperature field for CMB photons. So let me stop here, perhaps now, but we can talk more so about the it. the x variables there are? Positions. 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 These are correlators. So in cosmology, we measure correlators at constant time now, but as a function of positions. OK, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Now we have the coffee break, and we reconvene at quarter past, 20 past, 25 minutes. 20 past noon. I'm
Anche lui non è possibile riprenderlo qua. Uh, HDMI yeah. Yeah, yeah. con no? no. Cioè, no, non funziona perché il Mac il grafico del chat dobbiamo riprendere il telo e via quindi se è solo un pdf senza video senza niente magari is it a pdf? then maybe it's better if you... it's more difficult to, to record that video ok then I'll just copy We have a, I just, I just make it out. You have a, a new speaker. Yeah. 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 No, 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 The best the ratio of the plant of the plant length of the plant of the plant of the plant of the plant of the 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 No, no, he's asking what is the analog of uh, it's, like it's like the gravitational scatter. It's like the gravitational scatter. Sorry. No, it's fine. Sure, So the name is Wally Pisa. This one? Pisa. So, yes. Yeah. Looks fine. I would say. Ah, okay, it's, it's not connected, but uh, is it fine like this? Yeah, sure. Let's see if it displays correctly on the screen, but it should be. Should I take a. Yeah, I, I. Wait, I have to. I don't know how this works. No, no, come Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Why never they tell me what you did with the Why could you do with the It's also so It was nice. And Connor said you could have a situation where they have a region where it's not flowing, a region where it's because of what the signals in the corners. It's sufficiently that it's sufficiently. Yeah, it's not super low. Yeah, it sounds deep. No, which is not true. It's true. It's true. It's not causing enough. It's not causing enough. Yeah, it is not. You want to be cold so that you're going to see the spontaneous heart rate. You don't want to have a whole bunch of high temperature waves. You don't want to have a super high temperature. You should use a flashback battery. What? You would have a natural ability. Flashback presence will give you? No. Yes. Ah, and it just makes stronger reactions. Yeah. That's true. No, that's so one why I asked you. So yes. Why are you why do you want to increase the problem with that action? Let me ask you. Why 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 do you think it's uh it because phonon interactions come from non semi classical. They're beyond semi classical. Yeah, and I, I have difficulty I have difficult understanding what you mean. Well if, if you write down uh, See, there are no phonon interactions. Uh, I have to remember. Uh, you're throwing away at some point when you when you write down. You, you throw. You only have two. Okay, your interaction term in the Hamiltonian of a BC has four operators. Yes. Two raising operators and two lowering operators. You throw away phonon phonon interactions. You, yeah, you throw away two of them, and you don't have any more phonon and phonon interactions. Yeah. And that's in my semi-classical yeah. approach. Because you are yeah. doing it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, if you, if I ran into quant analog quantum gravity, you have all these operators, and the phonons are going to interact. And I wonder, does that change the Hawking radiation? Or give me a firewall? Or I don't know what it does. Yeah, but the idea of using the phonon on the interactions is that it's kind of fun. Yeah, sure. What's your name? In uh, describing the so in spontaneous uh, of gravitation, because if you have a more mode of the time bound interaction, you are chatting each other, and this explains you also this depending on the curvature you will see. Because then uh -huh. you inside this mode, then they start to interact, and you to interaction. You're talking about dispersion relation? Dispersion relation. Yeah, that because is. you see the band of these excited modes. They can drive them back. Okay. That's why. Meaning it's a lie in London. Yes, it's a lie in London. Okay, you're saying that the nonlinear dispersion relation comes yes. from. Yes. Yeah, from yeah that makes sense. Because the higher. So you see that okay. it goes first up and then it goes down. Well, yeah, that's it, but that's only in the moving frame. In the, the non-moving frame, it's just super aluminum. But then what did Giovannazzi conclude about the... He proposes, okay, the experiments is high, very, very, very strong mm -hmm. interacting. It's no longer boson, yeah. but then it, um, it it works completely different than that. Okay. You are, uh, so, 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 so maybe ask totally a question. It turns is it possible to simulate this in a system that's also a non-boson analysis? Because yeah, this a linear dispersion is that no, 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 it's not. It's not yeah, really that. Yeah. Yes. So, for instance, yes, of course, there are systems. Yeah. There are systems in condensed matter at the critical point, at the critical point, and a conformal gravity. So, or the lower gravity. It's an analog gravity. Yesterday yeah. showed one. Does that mean a linear dispersion? No, that mean, of course, it means a linear. It means more, much more. What he's saying is okay, that I just. No, no, look, look, sound waves. Look, the thing we are using here, the thing we are using here to discuss, have a linear dispersion relation. But they are not normative matter. I mean, sound they don't have a linear. Okay, yeah, they're the first linear. Sound linear, but then it curves up. Yeah, yeah, but a very long wave. A okay, very, okay. very long wave. Okay, so I have Still, okay, if you okay. if you take a motorbike and you move yeah. in this thing, you're going to move because you're heavy. Yeah. So you see that. So there is a preference. Eh? No, you use the hand. So you see, there is a preferential frame. Uh, there are systems. Where, where at the critical point, they have a much bigger accidental symmetry and a symmetry of the law, the conformal group, which contains the whole group. So you mean including interactions? No, because no, but it's no, 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 yes, you, you, you go to a quantum critical point, at the quantum critical point, uh, say, take for instance that the systems of, let's say, there are two plus one dimensional systems. I don't know how they realize. 
I don't know if these things are exactly. the very exactly. such as the realize them. Okay, good. See, I'm, I, I don't know anything. So, I'm, so, I'm, yes, I, so you're not a Buna Capo. So I'm just saying, in such a book, there are these examples of uh, a law. I mean, there's a lattice, you put some doping, and then there is a critical value of the chemical potential where you are exactly at the bottom. Well, uh, yes. No, normally, the critical surface is a Schrodinger symmetry. But there's a specific point, which is the point where in, uh, in, um, in the Chemical potential, where, where the critical surface is parallel to the chemical potential, okay, where clearly in increasing and decreasing the chemical potential, you move along critical surface. Then you have CPT. Therefore, that's the way you are controlling that. And that's the way it's found. Yeah. So there, there, but, but I don't know whether the systems are realized in the branch. I don't know whether these systems are realized in practice or not. No, but yesterday you, they, you have to the system I showed the relativistic back in the limit in which I was finding the Nostrum equation mm -hmm. is the limit in which basically the speed of sound becomes the speed of light. So it's basically relativistic all the way. In that case, instead of having uh, this formal method, uh, method, you have a conformal method. You get a conformal invariance. And that was the limit in which I was recovering Nostrum gravity for the dynamics of the background expressed in the term of the analog method. Yeah, but which is a uh, okay, good strong gravity, sure, which is yeah. a pretty conformal sure, 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 sure. So I wonder if this is a yeah, example. Yeah, but Ricardo was asking whether it is so really. Beh, relativistic back in principle has yeah. never been yeah. done, but in principle I don't know why you shouldn't be able to do a relativistic back. It's just that the outputs are relativistic. It's not that. No, 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 really, really, really. No, no, I'm thinking about. No, no, no. Uh, relativistic back. Uh, no, I was asking the comments. I was asking the comments. Is a system where normally you have that the phonons are the, the basically special relativistic dispersion relation for long wavelengths. And I, at frequency, you get a, a, you know, it's the dispersion relation of the relativistic atom, so you have back to relativistic. Yeah, but and you have a Lorentz breaking all in the middle, but you can tune the system, there is a kind of critical. No, but he's, talk, he's talking about not just dispersion, he's talking about interactions. No? Yeah. But then I. If you're right, no, of course I'm talking about very, very, very long. Of course I'm talking about very, very long distance. There are systems that are very, very long distances but not, no, have an accidental Lorentz invariance, including the interactions. But why do you want interactions with Lorentz invariance? Just to see the fact yeah, that, for instance, yeah. when, when the guys you meet, they can not get because they are. The interaction there is. It's true that in the end, in the end, in the end, it's only asymptotic, right? So because you're always in the way of the finite momentum, and you're never really in the interaction. But anyway, for all your radiation, you don't need the full Lorentz invariance. It's enough. Uh, it's so you think you have but the question of the interaction, but the question of the interaction is different. Because mm -hmm. if you're Lorentz invariance, you can not. If it doesn't like what we need, probably. Well, the phone is. For instance, you're measuring for radio, no? Yeah, density, density, quality. So now, if you want to include the phone of phone interactions, mm -hmm. like this basic already, yeah. for example, a loop diagram, mm -hmm. which we can do certainly on a uniform background. Now, with this thing, no, yes, yes, no, but then there's going to be, there's gonna be yeah. some, okay. some non universal dependence on the shape of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the source, but that's it, right? And there are universal and non universal features in this result. So that's interesting. Okay. It's something that you can do systematically, even closing the higher level. Yes, yes. And for that, the basic things you can do for the most of the No, no, my fault. My fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to do this experiment. It's an amazing experiment. Eh? Yeah, yeah, well, there you have a lot of other things. I'm not sure you're right? saying. Not so. Well, in a sense, so in a sense, he's saying that. So if you think in terms of that, no, he's saying that. Phono phone interactions go beyond the same classics because now you have a loop. Sure, right? sure, sure, sure. So, in a sense. Although yeah. even uh, the scattering of two quantum, I mean, the division of one quantum is. But you say that one loop is not enough because you if the theory is weakly coupled, if the theory is weakly coupled, two loop is less than one loop, three loop is less than. I mean, if, if it, one loop is not enough, then what do you stop? If one loop is not enough, what do you stop? Yeah, you can do lateral approximation. That means that you're expanding around the wrong point. If you start there to resign, this is what you're doing. Yeah, but the
è incredibile quella storia di... Sto pensando invece al contrario, se uno potrebbe fare una, un'analisi di quando lo per vedere cosa è quel tipo di, di vortex. Eh, analizzarli come un effetto geometrico, cioè se... Qual è l'analog metrica di quelli? Thank you. 
Well, this is fine now. And uh, to change the... Forward back. Ah, okay. A bit... Uh, yeah, it's a bit... Can I make it a little bit... Uh, uh, no. It's okay. No, not possible, okay. All right. Why do we make it smaller, but then... I'll manage, don't, don't, don't worry. What can you eat, what can you eat? Okay. 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Okay, let's start again with the last talk of this morning. We have Giad Vali that will speak about universal laws uh, laws of quantum information. Okay. Um, I want to thank. Um, I want to I want to thank organizers first of all uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'm going to discuss about universality of laws of quantum information. So what I want to show and uh, propose that uh, the seemingly different objects like uh, black holes, uh, the universe, I mean the Hubble patch of the, the Citar universe, um, and uh, sub solitons, baryons, instantons, all normal quantum theoretic uh, objects, they, they store, they, they, they obey the same laws of information. Uh, storage and processing, uh, just exactly the same, same as black holes. Um, so the way, um, sorry. So the way I will uh, structure the, the talk uh, will be following. So I will, uh, the central focus will, will be of course on information because that's the most mysterious, it's considered to be the, the most mysterious uh, uh, part of uh, black hole physics. And I will try to show that the, if, if this uh, equally, this, this, the same things equally work in, in, in quantum field theories, in other quantum field theories without gravity, even, even, even uh, norm, renormalizable ones. Uh, and so what I will do, I will first present uh, commonly accepted things and the certain derivations, basically facts that you can just simply check with no assumptions. And uh, then I will try to interpret these observations. Okay, so then there will be interpretations. So, um, so there are two things uh, about information that are very important. First is, uh, where is the pointer? Oh. Ah, oh, this is advanced. Uh, so, uh, so one is uh, Bekenstein bound, this on, on information storage, which has, uh, a priori has nothing to do with gravity, but it's universal. So this bound says that if uh, we uh, have an object of energy m and, and the radius r, the, the maximal entropy it can have is m times r. I, I'm dropping out uh, the pi's. I will restore pi's later uh, for, for just to illustrate uh, certain ex expressions. Um, and on the other hand, this, this bound, the, 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 known ob the, the most well-known object, or actually the only object I have seen discussed in the literature that satisfies this bound, uh, are black holes, so it's, it's well known. And um, so black hole satisfies this bound. And the uh, interesting thing is that it takes, in case, it takes area form, okay? So area in Planck units. Oh, sorry. What is now the question is, what is the physical meaning of this uh, bound, of Bekenstein bound? I mean, regardless of gravity. And what is the physical meaning of the area law? Why area law? When, when it gets saturated by black holes. Are black holes special in this case, in this sense? Okay. Now, as I said, this, this bound has mostly been discussed within gravity. And the question is, what happens beyond gravity? What happens, for instance, in renormalizable quantum field theories? Now, the first two results that I will, I, will, I will show and demonstrate is that 
these are two two general laws that we are uncovering of information storage. So the, the Bekenstein bound is saturated, regardless of gravity. Well, if you have a theory and you have an object, and you saturate it, saturates Bekenstein bound. Necessarily, simultaneously, you saturate unitarity. Okay, this the same theory. Um, and simultaneously, entropy assumes the area law. This is universal. I, it, this may come as, as a sh shocking statement, okay? But as I will show, this is universal. So always at that point, at the saturation point, the bound has the law of the area in arbitrary number of dimensions. This is in, in, in dimensionality invariant, this statement. Where f is always a well-defined scale that sets the four-point four point interaction of corresponding degrees of freedom. In fact, Goldstone degrees of freedom, as you will see, okay? Um, now let's come back to Bekenstein Hogging Entropy, it's, it's famous form area in, uh, sorry, go back, not like this, area in, uh, we always say that it's area. Now the question is, maybe there is an equivalent way of formulating this bound. Why are we necessarily focused on the area and not something else? So. What that something else could be? Uh, by the way, the, the fact that we present it as an area uh, gives rise to all, all these fascinating ideas about holography and et cetera. But does this same expression have different meaning from the point of view of a quantum field theorist? I'm a particle physicist, an, an S-metrics person. For me, everything is an S-metrics process. The black holes are resonances in the S-metrics process, et cetera, okay? So for a particle physicist, what is the meaning? Because area is a geometric notion. And we know that geometry is an approximate notion, always. Geometry is something that you can only, t only, only talk about in the classical limit or semi-classical limit. Okay? So now, what is gravity from the point of view of particle physics or, or quantum theory, quantum field theory or quantum string theory, same thing? Uh, it's a QFT of graviton. In, in, the same is true in also, it, same is true in GR. Yeah, once you quantize it, according to normal rules of quantum field theory, same is true about in low energy string theory. So low energy string theory is a QFT of, uh, closed string theory is a QFT of, of a massless uh, spin, to, spin to particle, okay? And this massless spin to particle has a four-point coupling, dimensionless quantum coupling that says this dimensionality. And as, we, as you know very well, this coupling depends on the uh, De Broglie wavelength of momentum transfer. So basically, if you have uh, a graviton, so wavelength uh, R interacting with uh, typical momentum transfer, so the, the, the coupling uh, is simply one over R, typical momentum of these gravitons, uh, in Planck units. But notice that this is area. It's a fact of nature. So this is not an assumption or anything like that. So in other words, it's a fact of nature that gravitational four-point coupling scales as area in arbitrary number of dimensions. Okay, so that's just a property of gravitational coupling. Therefore, uh, I don't know why we are always saying that black hole entropy is an area and not inverse of the gravitational coupling. Um, so I could have wrote, written black hole entropy as one over alpha g, alpha gravity, and this would be a correct statement. It's a fact. Okay. The question is, which one is more fundamental? Should I think in terms of area, geometric notion, or should I think in terms of alpha, particle physics notion, okay? Um, so now in order to answer this question, let's try to understand is this exceptionally property of gravity, or the same property is satisfied by other quantum field theories, okay? Um, for example, a gauge theory, right? So in gauge theory, alpha is g square, four point function. So what I will show is that this is the universal law of information storage. Okay, so what happens is that in any theory, regardless whether it gravi contains gravity, doesn't contain gravity, renormalizable, not renormalizable, 
you have an object, let's say self-sustained bound state, and uh, you deform your theory, or you manufacture your theory or, or the object in such a way that it saturates back and time bound on information storage. So in then in that limit, the following is true, that the bound, Bekenstein bound, is equal to one over the, the coupling square, coupling constant, one over alpha, and it's, it is equal to the area. This is a universal story, okay? And this is, I think it's, an, it's absolutely fascinating that this is what is happening in uh, quantum field theories. Now I will, demo, of course I cannot go all, all, uh, list down the list of 30 or 40 objects, but I will demonstrate it for two and present result for third, and you will see that this, this, this works. The moment you follow this, you will, you, you, will, you will accept that this works universally, okay? It's so obvious. Now, let, let me demonstrate it for toft polego monopole and the baryon in large N QCD, okay? Now, for toft polego monopole, as I, as I will show, the, when you saturate the bound, Bekenstein bound, the, the, the entropy becomes one over g square of gauge, of course, and it's an area in the units of V. And remember, V is the four-point coupling of gold stones, okay? So it plays the same role as, the, as Planck scale, as G Newton plays for uh, four-point coupling of gravitons. For the baryon, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really amazing that it's the same thing. So once baryon saturates Bekenstein entropy, again, the entropy is one over G square, and its area in the units of pi on decay constant. Again, it's a four-point coupling of goldstones. I mean, pi ions are real goldstones. Um, yeah. Yes, you are interrupting a speaker. Yeah, uh, tell me. Tell me. Is it because you're considering always cases that the kinetic term is too very? No, no, look, it's, it's so. It's so obvious, will be so obvious that you, I think you will not have this question. I mean, once you see, you hear the, the whole point was to ask the, the right question. Once you ask the right question and go through, anyone, any graduate student can, can, can just derive it, okay? So the whole point here was to ask this question, okay? And I'm, I'm really surprised what, how come this was never asked and, and, and uh, right. Uh, the same is true about instanton, exactly the same thing. So it's always the same thing, and this only happens when theory saturates unitarity. This is extremely important, okay? This is my talk, so, yeah. Uh, right, so, uh, no, no, this is an excellent question. <laughs> right. The monopole, let's start with the monopole. So, okay, you, this is a textbook, textbook case of Polego monopole. The simplest is when it is produced in the theory with spontaneously broken or in the, the SO3 symmetry in the Higgs phase. So we introduce a Higgs field, Higgs triplet is the simplest one. We, we write down the, the extremely well-known Lagrangian. And, yes, sorry, uh, but are you going now to the proof of the first? Yeah, it's so obvious that there is nothing even to prove. I mean, let's see, so follow, just follow. I mean, I don't see what is to prove there. Look. Uh, okay, so there, there is a monopole solution. So far, this is textbook physics, and uh, monopole is a hedgehog, and it has a size, and the size of the monopole is given by the Compton wavelength of the of the gauge boson. Um, but yes, I'm going to prove, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so the, the notice the following thing, that the monopole mass and the size, they satisfy this property. So the monopole uh, size is the Compton wavelength of the, of the, of the photon, of the, sorry, of the uh, W boson. And uh, this is G times V, V is the expectation value. And the mass of the monopole is MV divided by G square. That's typical of solitons. The mass of the soliton always goes as one over coupling. Now, entropy bound on the monopole, if someone tells you, okay, I have this toft polego monopole, what would be the entropy bound, Bekenstein bound? You would say, oh, of course, I have to take mass of the monopole multiplied by the size. And notice that this is one over G square. Okay, so already we see that the bound on the monopole uh, entropy is one over G square, exactly as the black hole entropy in the corresponding, in the corresponding uh, parameters. Of course, now you want to see how what happens with the theory when we saturate the bound? Of course, not every monopole uh, saturates uh, Bekenstein time bound, but we are interested at the saturation point. Um, 
So there are, I, I don't know, many ways to, to, to saturate the bound using the monopole. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just sketch two. So for instance, one straightforward way is to uh, couple a monopole to a, actually it's a very nice way, uh, a nice construction. So you, you take monopole and you couple it to a sigma model, SO, SO and sigma model. But sigma model, which in vacuum is not spontaneously broken. So you are coupling monopole to a Goldstone model, okay? But in the vacuum, it's not spontaneously broken. But then you de demand that it's, it is spontaneously broken in the mo on the monopole, in the core of the monopole. Okay, that's very easy to arrange. So you have a sig sigma model field, the sigma, um, and uh, so you couple it to the monopole field, and uh, you, you break the symmetry. Uh, now, you break the symmetry, what happens is this, that the monopole uh, profile, so, so, so the monopole profile and the sigma profile, they exchange places. So, so sigma field has expectation value on the monopole, and it vanishes in the vacuum, and, the, and monopole other way around. So what happens is that uh, there is a spontaneous breaking of uh, SON symmetry in the monopole core, and they are N Goldstone modes, N. These Goldstone modes, they are localized on the monopole, obviously, because the symmetry is, is, is not broken in the vacuum. So in other words, what happens is that, um, so once, since the symmetry is, is a good symmetry in the vacuum, monopole falls into a well-defined representation under the symmetry group. And this representation, as you can see very easily, is a high, high rank, actually of rank one over G square, symmetric representation, okay? So, and you can immediately, from there, you can derive entropy, but you can do in more detailed, you can do more detailed analysis. So therefore, the number of degenerate microstates that the monopole has, so now I'm ca simply counting microstates, so in other words, the, the, the degeneracy of the monopole, okay? Um, so the monopole entropy goes as n, okay? And now, uh, what about unitarity? Okay, so now the point is that since there are n degrees of freedom in your theory, okay, there is a unitarity bound. G squared times n cannot exceed one. So this is effectively a Toft coupling. Okay, so it's like a Toft coupling. Toft coupling normally we're introducing uh, QCD. And I will go to QCD in a second. But here is the same thing. So, typically, so unitarity demands that the coupling times the num n number of uh, species uh, cannot exceed cannot exceed one. Okay. So therefore, it's always a saturation point of unitarity when n when n is one over g square. Now, now it's, it's it's totally trivial. Now you see. So the maximal so entropy of the monopole is n, and that is maximal. Maximal can be one over G square in unitary theory, and that's the Bekenstein bound. And that's the area, okay? So everything goes through. So G square n here is the root expansion parameter. Of course, of course, yeah, unitary. But then, then you could have a situation with G square like, I mean, there are specific situations where the application can be large. Yeah, so that's precisely my point. Like, like in n equal four, if you have the... We get there. Okay. But that's precisely my point. My point is that saturation happens when the top coupling is one. This is universal statement. Now we can ask questions, what happens after, before, etc. Actually, this opens up an extremely interesting set of questions. Um, now, you can do exactly the same by introducing fermions. So instead of coupling to SO and sigma model, you can couple to SO and fermion model. So you introduce fermions and you, you, you get exactly the same counting. So as you know, Jack, there, there, is this, there are these famous Jacquive and Rebi um, uh, zero modes on, on, on the monopole whenever you couple it to the fermion, but because of the index theorem. And uh, so they are n-localized zero modes, and it's the same thing. So again, it just goes through, okay? It doesn't matter. In other words, the, 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 the statement is that it doesn't matter how you endow monopole with high entropy and how you saturate bound. You have to satisfy this, this fact that it, it, you have to saturate unitarity simultaneously, and it's always area. Um, now, let's go to baryons. Actually, baryons are even more fascinating because normally, um, um, we don't say, think that baryons should be like black holes, okay? It sounds like, like a, a real stretch of the imagination, but, uh, but actually that's, that's what comes out. So let's see. 
Now let's consider baryons in SUN QCD with large number of colors. Of course, these things are interested, interesting in large N, obviously, because large N is precisely when objects are approximately, you can go between semi-classical and quantum. Now, uh, with the, we had certain number of flavors, and flavors, so NCR is now index of colors, and N is number of flavors. Now we take Toft limit, this famous limit, when we take uh, a coupling uh, N, NC large, G square NC fixed, this is Toft coupling, G square NC, and QCD scale is, is a parameter of the theory. Now, uh, this theory is well understood, so, uh, the first I'm introducing moderate number of uh, fermion flavors. I don't want to go over, I, I, I want to have theory asymptotically free, of course, and I don't want to break unitarity, et cetera, in UV. Uh, so, um, so there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking, as you know very well, because there is a chiral symmetry, and the, the, the fermions flavors, left-handed and right-handed, transform independently. The fermions here are massless, and this chiral symmetry is broken spontaneously down to, the, uh, down to a diagonal uh, vector-like subgroup, and they are n square minus one goldstones, pions. Uh, there is one eta prime that gets mass from the anomaly, as, as we know. Now, the, the, the pion decay constant scales as square root of nc uh, in uh, QCD units, in Q, QCD scale units, and this is very important. Now, let me take, uh, so what is the baryon? Now, now I'm considering a baryon in this theory, okay? In large and QCD, uh, this has been st uh, studied uh, long ago by Witten and, and, and others. So it's perfectly well understood. Okay, baryon is a bound state of N quarks, and N C quarks. There's N reality in, in the theory. Theory is confining. And the, si and the size of the baryon is given by the QCD scale, QCD length. Okay, so size, size of the baryon is given by the QCD length. Now the bus, mass of the baryon is given by NC times lambda. Okay, scales as NC because it is, it's composed of NC quarks. This was demonstrated very clearly by Witten. Now, therefore, if someone tells you, okay, here is my large N QCD, I have a baryon in this QCD. By the way, you can choose the lambda, you can choose your theory with now lambda is a parameter. You could even make your baryon of galactic size. That's, that's up to you. I mean, okay, um, so baryon could, could, could be macros macroscopic, whatever, it doesn't matter. So it's, um, and uh, so, you, so what is the entropy bound? Of course, you have to again take mass, multiply by the size, and you get NC. So therefore, the, the entropy bound, the maximal entropy that can be attained by, by a baryon in large NQCD is NC. Okay, so let's see now what happens. Now, you saturate unitarity, again, NC, or order N, and one over G square. And at that point, baryon entropy becomes, which is N, was NC, becomes N, N is NC, so you are saturating the entropy bound. So you are saturating entropy bound at Toft coupling one, at the unitarity bound. Right. That's also the point where it was confined. Exactly, that's my, that's another point. <laughs> right. <laughs> This, uh, so, that, so, at the unit, so at the unitarity bound, now we have, again, this is one over G square, but notice that this is area. This is area in, in, in pi on decay constant, okay? So again, it's the same, same, same story. Again, the area law. Now, exactly the same result is for the instantons. I will not go through the derivation. I don't want to bore you because this over and over again, the same story repeats itself. Now, the instantons, as you know, instantons, they, they always correspond to solitons in one dimension higher. So you can think of entropy of a soliton. Now, here I'm introducing also an additional concept, which is a sub, would be a subject of a different talk, because I think it makes perfect sense to endow instanton with an entropy, not a only a corresponding soliton, the, the soliton corresponding to an instanton, which is an ob object, but also a process to endow it with an entropy and I think this is extremely important, and some new things come out there. But uh, okay, I, I will not discuss. I will not enter there at this point. So, for this sake of this discussion, you can think about instanton entropy as the entropy of a corresponding soliton. And um, the same thing happens. So over and over again, it's the area. Actually, in this case, it's even uh, okay. Anyway. The, 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 
let, let me not, not enter there. So anyway, it's, the, it's, it's always the same story. It repeats itself uh, in units of the coupling of the corresponding goldstones. Now, um, the, the goldstones here are, you may ask who are the goldstones. So the goldstones here are, they are always goldstones whenever you endow see it's, it's universal. So whenever you have entropy, they're always goldstone like modes or gold, real goldstones. Now, for instance, for the instanton, if you embed instanton in SUN, you, you generate instanton degeneracy, and uh, goldstones are precisely correspond to the spontaneous breaking of global part of SUN symmetry down to SUN minus two, okay, by the, uh, by the instanton or so, soliton solution, okay? So therefore, conclusions, temporary conclusions are that uh, there is, we are witnessing universal phenomena um, that uh, Bekenstein bound is, is saturated together with unitarity and it's always area law. And so therefore, equally well, I could rewrite bound as one over the coupling. So in other words, what I claim is that there is an equivalent formulation of the bound and actually in some cases it's even more useful because the result, the result is uh, sometimes people were coming up with some puzzling situations, or you can come up with a puzzling situation where it's as if the, the Bekenstein bound is violated, but then you immediately see that this way it's not. Okay, so it's, it's one over coupling. Now this is very important because, uh, because coupling is something that tells you about dynamics of the theory. You see, area is a geometric notion, but, but the coupling is, 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 is quantum dynamics, and it's quantum. Yeah, so this is just a summary. So there is a correspondence between uh, G and Newton and Goldstone coupling and the, and, the, and the graviton coupling. Now, now let's, let's try to understand, now let's come back to, actually this will uh, address this question. Now let's, let me come back to black holes, okay? So now, uh, so it looks like that we see exactly the same behavior, the same phenomena over and over again. Okay, and now in renormalizable theories, we understand that this has to do with the saturation of unitarity. Now, let's ask this question. What's the interpretation in case of uh, gravity, in, ca in case of black holes? Uh, what's the connection with unitarity? Okay, and actually it's the, it's the same connection as you will see. Now, there's an old idea by Toft, Gross, Mende, and Amati, Ciappalloni, Veneziano, and um, a lot of papers after that that uh, in the, the trans uh, high energy scatterings must be dominated by, by black holes, okay? Now, the, the, the already semi-classical ar argument is, is pretty strong. It's obvious because once you, put, it doesn't matter whether the energy is stored in your two quanta, or is original two quanta, or many. So it doesn't matter whether you have a collapsing star or a two extremely energetic particles, once you put the, the energy in, in, within the Schwarzschild radius, you, you are forming a black hole. We even predicted this at LHC uh, in the paper with the, and on large extra dimensions with uh, Antoniadis, uh, uh, Argani Hamed and Dimopoulos. And uh, actually we were very careful. We said there explicitly that this would be quantum black holes. LHC has no chance of probing semi-classical black holes. That's simply impossible, okay? At best, what LHC could do Maybe there is still hope to, to, to probe the first beginning of the tower. So, the, so in other words, black, black holes uh, of the mass of the fundamental Planck, Planck scale. Those are not uh, semi-classical. Those correspond to n equals one in my language. They are just literally like elementary particles and resonances, okay? So therefore to say that LHC has any potential to see a semi-classical black hole, that's, uh, that's a confusion, okay? Uh, it cannot happen, but it's simply by energy available in, in, in LHC collisions. And what we know about bounds on, on quantum gravity from, from, from other uh, constraints. So anyway, so coming back to, uh, to, to here, is that, um, okay, so you're forming these black holes. Now, the point is that some time ago, we tried to view this process, uh, to understand this process, as a, from the point of view of S matrix person, a complete process. Now, now you say, if you are an S matrix person, you would say the complete process should be two particles into a black hole and into N, okay? So this is approximate number of quanta into which the, the, the black hole will decay finally, okay? Uh, 
Roberto also mentioned this 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 in, 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 in uh, yesterday. Um, so and uh, the softness, which corresponds to the typical Hawking temperature um, size, so, I mean inverse uh, inverse size. Okay. All right. So now the question is, if you look at this process as two to n process, then naturally would say, okay, then if I'm an S matrix person, the right place to look at is two to n, not two to two. Two to two is also fine, but they should be exponentially suppressed and extremely rare uh, at, at, at high uh, transpunction collision, but two to n. And um, um, actually, we did this computation. Uh, to, uh, these two groups did it, okay. Uh, and uh, we did it in both in, in quantum uh, theory and, uh, well, okay, we did. We did, we computed whatever we could. We, of course, we always compute things in the regime where we are under control, uh, where we, can, we are in control. And, uh, okay, and that's, uh, 2 to n is a nice regime there, okay, for, from this point of view, because it's large in physics. Uh, as, as, and, uh, Okay, so actually the first thing is that it, it turns out that string theory computations and, and, and quantum uh, field theory, quantum gravity field theory computations, they give, you the same, they give you the same answer up to one over n corrections. Second thing, you see that there, is a one over, there are one over n corrections. So if you recover, let's say you, 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 let's say you, you trust that this, this is the, you are an S matrix person, so you believe that this should be the S matrix process. Then uh, you should recover Hawking in infinite n limit, okay? Uh, but you see that there are always one over n corrections. This is a series in one over n. Okay, this immediately tells you where the so-called information corrections are hiding. They are hiding in one over n corrections, okay? Now, in infinite n, of course, the, everything is uh, should be everything should be as, as as Hawking predicted. But also, black hole is infinitely long-lived in that limit. Again, there is no, of course, if you have an infinitely long-lived object. There's no problem with anything, with any information or anything like that. But anyway, okay, this talk is not about information, although it, it sheds, I think it sheds a powerful light on this, this kind of things. Um, so in any case, um, sorry, this is. So now what happens is that the, the here, the, the what is important for me to make connection with this, uh, the, this entropy counting. I mean, these are facts so far, right? So uh, the, the, the typical behavior of the matrix element is this, n factorial alpha g times n, okay? And uh, alpha G is the effective coupling, because which, which is set by the effective momentum flow through the vertices, okay? So effective momentum transfer in, in the vertices. It goes like P over N Planck, where P is E over N, and basically Hawking quantum, okay? So alpha G is this. Now, you see the following. So now, if you take this uh, old hypothesis seriously that uh, Transplankian scatterings are dominated by black holes, if you take this uh, seriously, then you see immediately where the unitarity should be saturated. Then, because then black holes saturate unitarity, and as, a, as an S matrix 2 to n process, you see that, um, you see that this happens for alpha, okay, when P is TH, and correspondingly, alpha is one over n, which is the same, becomes say, for this value of the softness becomes one over n, and the area. By the way, in this limit, the, the production of each micro, what you can call microstate, goes as exponent minus n. You can use Stirling approximation, and you see that this exponent minus s, and so you have large number, and so this compensates. But okay, that part is not important for, for, for this talk although it's important in, in general. But what is important is that these uh, scattering amplitudes, they tell us that alpha G has a well-defined meaning of saturation of the unitarity, okay? But unlike in, in, in no, renormalizable uh, field theories where this is obvious, because everything is renormalizable, you can see, there you have to go back and realize that black holes dominate, uh, black holes dominate the, Transplankian scattering processes, okay? Now, let me, how, how much time do I have? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, great. Now, the, so far what I presented, these are only based on uh, commonly accepted facts. So I just started from commonly accepted facts and even textbook things and derivations. So you can derive there everything 
then there's no hypothesis. Uh, now the question is, what does this tell us about the quantum structure of a black hole, okay? Right, so from here on, there are ideas uh, which, so what does this tell us about the quantum structure of a black hole? Well, uh, already if you are, if you are, so you know that baryons, let's take, let's take baryons. You know that baryons are composites, okay? Solitons are also composites in, in, in certain well-defined sense. And you see that over and over, the same behavior of black hole information pattern, the black hole information properties, repeats itself for composites which you can understand, which are extremely well understood. Now, the property of these composites is that they are always at the critical point. In other words, they are critical or unitarity saturation point, or which is this relation. So n is equal to one over alpha, okay, for all those composites. So therefore, it's reasonable now that this observation justifies the idea that black holes are also composites. Now, of course, everything indicates in that direction. S matrix processes indicate in that direction, because if you have a huge object that decays into N soft quanta, it must be possible to, in, there must be some well-defined way to think about this object as a composite, okay? Um, and so this idea was independent of this, okay? Uh, we proposed this several years ago with Cesar Gomez. And yeah, our idea was based on this general intuition that, that macroscopic objects must be composite, okay? Uh, and, and there, the, um, the black hole is, 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 a, is a bound state, is a self-sustained bound state because this is precisely this criticality point where this is self-sustained of uh, soft gravitons and soft gravitons. And uh, the moment you postulate that, you see that every indication points that this is, there is something in this picture that is correct. Uh, now, of course, there may be things that are hard to calculate. That's obvious because we are dealing with gravity and of course we always calculate where we can. But what I'm saying is that there are clear signs that this is at least qualitatively the right picture, okay? I think it's more than qualitative. Now, for instance, in this picture, the moment you adopt that, the Hawking radiation is a depletion of the condensate. You can compute it now based on uh, rules of uh, quantum field theory, and you see that you do indeed recover thermal-like spectrum, uh, which should match Hawking in, in, in infinite n. Now, by the way, you can understand immediately why spectrum should be, should be thermal-like even without a computation. Why? Because look, I have a, I have a condensate that, that decays. So I have a condensate, and this condensate is self-sustained, but at the critical point, meaning that the, the coupling is barely enough to keep them together, okay? So what happens is that there is a depletion. You can estimate the, the rate of the depletion, and you can see that this is exactly Hawking rate, okay? Why depletion happens? Because the constituents, they rescatter quantum mechanically, okay? They rescatter and, and they push themselves up. You can understand this in the, in the language of Bogolubov transformation. In other words, since the air is interacting, since condensate is interacting, uh, by the way, this is here is important, that this is a condensate which is interacting and it's at the critical point. But of course, when people talk about condensates in many body physics, sometimes they have in mind weakly interacting condensates. Of course, weakly interacting condensates, they, they don't have entropy, much entropy, etc. Here we are at the critical point, okay? So the coupling constant is extremely weak, but the collective coupling, Toft coupling is, is order one, okay? So this is important. And so, sorry. And so, so why you get thermality? Because the typical momentum is, that comes out is the softness. So you have soft condensate, they scatter, and the typical momentum that you get is, the, is it corresponds to the soft, softness. Why? Because the, 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 with the highest probabilities, you have two graviton scattering, okay? Now, suppose you want to produce a very hard quantum out of this condensate. You j simply have to annihilate more than one quantum, okay? So basically, then this immediately tells you that since you need annihilation of more, more, more than one quantum, sorry, I'm totally confused with this. Um, so you need, this is suppressed. You pay the price, every time you pay the price, alpha in corresponding power. That's why you get thermal-like spectrum, okay? So in other words, if you view, view from this point of view, 
There is no mystery about thermal-like spectra. The thermal-like spectra are the property, generic property of the state of, of objects which are which consist of many soft quanta, okay? Since they consist of many soft quanta, it's always exponentially hard to produce a hard quantum out of, out of soft quanta, okay? That's the origin of thermality of uh, black hole radiation in this picture, okay? Now, by the way, the, we applied the same reasoning because I, it's, it's literally, as you know, there are a lot of similarities between black holes and uh, cosmological spaces, in particular the sitter space. And uh, okay, you, we, we applied the same thing to the sitter, um, and you can see that you can recover given Hawking radiation of the sitter in this picture. By the way, uh, for the sitter, life is actually even easy, even even nicer, because uh, in, for the sitter you can you can write down a coherent state at the critical point uh, or condensate at the critical point that resolves the sitter metric when you take gross pitevsky uh, limit, you, you recover the sitter metric, and you can see the decay of this condensate, and it gives you gibbons Hawking radiation. But now, there is an extremely important conclusion from here. Five minutes, great. There is an extremely important co conclusion, because if you buy the same, now you see, I'm going with an increasing level of uh, hypothes hypothesizing or specul speculation. So okay, the first part is just a fact. The black hole story, because black holes are asymmetric states, I think that's rigorous, that black holes are, are, are but, but at least that's a hypothesis. I, I cannot give you uh, the same level of proof as for the previous discussion, but it's a hypothesis, but I think that's absolutely justified because every consistency check we see is justified. But then there is a next step about cosmological space. Here things are non-trivial. Why? Because cosmological space, I don't know how to produce it in the asymmetric process, okay? so. I cannot just scatter two particles and produce the sitter space. I'm not talking about baby universes by Goose and um, others. Uh, that's different because that, that's it from, from an outside point of view, is viewed like a black hole. Okay, so I'm talking about producing real, uh, uh, fully fledged cosmological uh, background. And uh, of course, the, here there is a step which is speculative. In other words, what I'm saying is that because uh, there are similar properties for the sitter, and because of other arguments, which I unfortunately don't have time to, to present it here, but I think they are super strong, um, these arguments, uh, we must view the sitter as a coherent state. Because, okay, maybe I should say this, sorry. I have five minutes, but uh, I'll finish in five minutes. So you see, the point is this. In, in quantum field theory, especially, for instance, in, in string theory, or, or uh, any quantum gravity uh, that, that is based on quantum uh, story, um, it, it formulation is S-matrix formulation. So for instance, in string theory, we have S-matrix formulation. It's unclear whether other formulations are possible at the moment, okay? Um, and in the sitter, we cannot formulate S-matrix, okay? Now, because there's no globally defined time. This is not well known. I mean, this issue in 90s was well known by, by Witten and others, their papers. This is This is clear that we don't have uh, S matrix in, in the sitter. Now, suppose somebody tells you that and you are an S matrix person, okay? What, 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 what is that you're gonna conclude? So you say, okay, look, in, in quantum field theory or quantum theory, I have Hilbert space. And in Hilbert space, I have vacua and I have excited states, okay? Now, I can have super selection sectors. Each has its own vacuum. Now. The vacuum must be an S-matrix vacuum. If you cannot define S-matrix on a given state, this is an indication for me that this cannot be a vacuum. This means that the sitter cannot be a vacuum. Now, if it cannot be a vacuum, the only choice I am left with, that it must be considered as an excited state. Okay, now let me go ahead and construct excited state, this is the, which is the closest to the classical. That's a coherent state. Now, then the rest follows, because the moment you adopt that the sitter is a coherent state, is a composite state, okay, it depletes just exactly, just like black hole or any other, any other object, okay? It depletes, and this depletion has a good reason, because this is what, how we recover gibbons hawking radiation in this. We know that in the sitter there is gibbons hawking radiation. In classical theory, where all these things are hidden, this comes out as a vacuum process. 
Is this consistent with this? Of course, absolutely. Why? Because classical limit is taken when you take G Newton to zero, but you fix horizon fixed. That's a limit n going to infinity. In n going to infinity, of course, this is indistinguishable from the vacuum process because your, your state is an infinite reservoir of quanta and nothing will happen. It can deplete eternally, okay? So therefore, this, however, this picture tells you that we don't live in the universe with infinite n because G Newton is finite and the energy density is finite. So therefore, the sitter must have a finite lifetime. What does it mean, lifetime? So, we call this a quantum breaking time. In other words, there is a time scale. If you extrapolate these results, of course, here there is another new step of assumption. I'm assuming that I can extrapolate this computation to sufficiently long time scales, okay? Obviously, I'm two, two minutes, okay. So then you will see that the sitter must quantum break, meaning that it should go out of semi-classical regime completely after this time scale. This has extremely interesting cosmological implications. I don't have time to talk about it now. In remaining two minutes, let me ask the following question. What are the prospects of understanding this, this, uh, this phenomena in many body systems? So for some time, quite some time, we're, we, are, we are working on that in, in parallel. And um, well, there, there is this obvious, the guidelines are obvious. So what, what you need to do, you need to come up with a many body system in which you have attraction. So then, for instance, the simplest is, uh, and, and, and this is really incredible because it turns out that the simplest model that you can take, one dimensional ring, you can take one dimensional ring or an interval, you put bosons on this ring with contact interaction, delta function, okay? So this has many properties of what I described for these systems, for baryons, black holes, et cetera. So what are the properties? The properties is that these are, uh, there are two regimes. So there is a regime of weak coupling, a weak collective coupling when the condensate is uniform, and there is a regime of strong coupling, so strong collective coupling, when the condensate forms a soliton. Now, exactly at the transition point is the most interesting place, because that's where you saturate sort of unitarity from the point of view of uh, a, a, whoever observer uh, lives there. And what happens at that point, not surprisingly, you get gapless mods. And these are the gapless modes that store entropy. So it's connected, it's a, it's a, it's a self-contained system, okay? That gives you critic, criticality, it gives you, of course, this is a non-relativistic, if you want to do it in laboratory, this is a non-relativistic system. Of course, in non-relativistic system, unitarity is a tricky business because, I mean, you don't have to respect unitarity in, in, in non-relativistic system. Um, uh, in, a, in a given coupling, I mean, of course, at the end of the day, everything will be unitary because Hamiltonian is unitary, obviously, right? But uh, you don't have to be in the weakly, weakly interacting regime. There is no reason for that, okay? Uh, but still, it, it works exactly, despite the fact that this is a non-relativistic, it works exactly in the same way. So let me illustrate this, these points. For instance, these are, this, this rainbow is a microstate of a, this type of a black hole or, or whatever you want to call it, okay? And uh, so you see that when you are far away from criticality, the mods have high gaps, uh, then the gap is smaller, and at some point you get low, you get low gaps. And uh, this system, it turns out, also is a fast scrambler. So we sold it actually, um, uh, my students uh, and I that were listed there, we, we studied the system and with Cesar Gomez. We studied the system and this is density of states, and you can see that this uh, system has very interesting uh, scrambling properties. So it's, it's also scrambles in logarithmic time scale, et cetera, et cetera. But that, that's a story of uh, separate discussion. Okay, so this is the scrambling time in this system. Uh, okay, so let me finish with this uh, because I'm, I'm over time. I think, uh, I mean, uh, there is, um, conclusion is obvious. I think it's extremely interesting what, what we're observing, that there is this universal properties of, uh, of information uh, storage, and by the way, the confinement, one thing that I speculated even, that <laughs> it looks like maybe we can understand confinement as a preventing mechanism from QCD of, of violation and of the entropy bound. So QCD confines, if you look from that point of view, because it has no choice. Otherwise, it would violate uh, entropy bound, okay? And many other interesting things. Okay, let me finish here. Thanks a lot. So, yeah. so I would like just to 
Okay, we can talk privately, probably it's gonna take. Yeah. So this example that you had with the baryon, yeah. okay, so you have a large N right. uh, QCD. So strictly speaking, the Toft coupling at the, if NF, yeah, yeah, uh, what, right whatever it is. So now you, you pump up NF to the point where, uh, so you ask, you, you have so many flavors that, uh, that the, the coupling of the resonances doesn't go like one over N. It goes like one over N, but you have an NF enhancement, exactly, exactly, okay? Exactly. And then the question is, so it's not really the Toft coupling. This is the coupling of the flavor resonances. No, no, but this, this goes hand in hand because, you see, you cannot... Uh, no, 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 I, I agree, but... but, but when, when, Simultaneously, the Toft coupling should reach one. Right, but when an F... I see, what I see the criticality there is yeah. more or less what you were hinting at. When an F becomes... Right. Crosses. Exactly. By the way, we, we do this whenever we do composite Higgs, yeah. we, we think in these terms. The, the effective coupling of the yeah, resonances yeah, right, right. cannot be bigger than, yeah. than that bound because right. that corresponds yeah. to the point where you but you, that's not enough. you longer confine. Yeah. So, 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 in this, yeah. so in this case, this is the critical point. No, in, in that case, you don't saturate the entropy bound yet. You, 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 in that case, you, 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 for instance, you demolish asymptotic freedom somewhere, okay? Right. right? But... Uh, you don't necessarily saturate the entropy bound. What in order to saturate the entropy bound, in addition, Toft coupling should be one. Okay, so in other words, n should be equal. To, should be equal to n c. And sure, sure, no, no. But the Toft coupling is is one, or just one at the scale yeah, where you where you where you confine. Yeah, yeah. But, but but that's a dynamical thing, right? The the, the scale. No, I understand, but you cannot, for instance, you. No, no, I agree. You I cannot form baryon before at this right, right, this right, right. Tells, tells you that. right. I agree. So then the question is. Right. If there was a system, now uh, I cannot think of it carefully, where the Toft coupling can really be large, so then it looks like that the thing should saturate. I mean, you you cannot keep increasing the entropy. So what happens is that you go to yeah. another description exactly. where, where it's precise. dual. Exactly, that's absolutely fine. Okay, what Ricardo is asking, let me sort of... Uh, so in other words, in quantum field theory, we always have description, and in given description, we always choose right degrees of freedom, okay? So now, these descriptions, they change, like in QCD, for instance, pions, and they alternate with quarks and gluons. So what I'm saying is that once you are in a given description, in a given description, you have well-defined degrees of freedom, you compose an object out of those, those well-defined degrees of freedom, and you ask, can you saturate the entropy without pushing the bound? And you can. You, whenever you saturate the entropy, you are pushing the bound. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that theory doesn't make any sense. It just simply becomes theory of something else. It's like you can, no, you can no longer talk about pions at the distance is shorter than the QCD length. It's not a theory of pions anymore. It's not that it's wrong. It's simply inapplicable. And you have to re-diagonalize your Hamiltonian, and you go to the description of quarks and gluons. So of course, so what, see, this is always from a given domain of applicability. This, this, this rule is universal. Sure. Now, the same will be true in that domain. If you come top down, it's exactly the same story. By the way, for the baryon, they meet. Because as you know, the baryon, you can think of baryon as a, as a, as a composite of ions, as a skirmion. So it's exactly sure, the same. Sure. So, so both things, they meet. Yeah. So. Can I make one more comment? So you, you make two statements. One, I come to my first question that you probably is a trivial comment, or maybe even wrong. So you, well, you said that the entropy is saturated by one over, I mean, there's a bound one over g square, OK, right. I think. This seems very robust. And then there's a second statement that that goes like the area. Yeah. And so this, what I was saying, I was just saying something very silly, that if your kinetic term is to derivative, even the proper unit, the coefficient is one over area. So this is, um, so, so the, 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 the coefficient. We, we pro proper units, everything is there. Yeah, no, but I'm saying, no, I'm saying that if you had something that has a, well, if you had something like a one derivative kinetic term, would, would you still have area or something else? Like some chern simons When I'm talking about a four point function, I'm talking four point function in, of course, always in canonical normalized. Sure, 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 sure. So the rule really? is simple. You canonical normalize. No, don't make an impression that this is the, okay. this is the, the, no. You always make canonical normalized ghost. And in the, the, they have alpha, which is well defined. Like alpha in gravity is for canonical normalized gravitons, not for dimensionless ones. This is an extremely well defined rule. There is no ambiguity there. Uh, this is very important. Otherwise, yeah. 
uh, I know I should be able to, to arrive to the question myself if I think about, but may, maybe it's easier if you tell me. Uh, what's about, uh, so you tuned your theories in order to, to, to try to saturate this band. What's special about gravity that it's automatically saturated? What, so, what is it? So, fantastic point. So that's the only thing that is special about gravity, it, it looks like. So in, in other words, if you ask me what's the difference between uh, black holes or gravity and renormalizable quantum field theories, it looks like in renormalizable quantum field theories, you have to, you, you can have objects which do not saturate the bound, okay? So for instance, you can, in principle, you can have a soliton that is not saturating entropy bound. Uh, so there you have to make an effort to, 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 to force the soliton to saturate the entropy bound. Once it saturates the entropy bound, it becomes like a black hole from the point of information Information properties identical. In gravity, because gravity pro, pro, produces, uh, gravity gives you black holes at any scale. You see, gravity has a, <laughs> a a store, a bookstore, a store of black holes. You give me the scale, and I give you a black hole. That's why black holes saturate unitarity in high energy scattering or dominate high energy scattering. That's different because uh, those polygon monopoles they have fixed size, okay? Unless there is scale invariant, for instance, for, for instantons, the story is different because for any, for instantons, the story, because there, this is scale invariant. There are other considerations that enter there because I didn't discuss, I don't want to enter, but uh, that's the difference between gravity. So I'm not saying that gravity, uh, I'm not saying that gravity is, is, is trivial, it's, it's fascinating and it's, of course it's special, but not in the, in the sense of, uh, the information storage, and there is a universality in this law of information storage, okay? So gravity always saturates unitarity, that's the short answer, right? Okay, I don't see other questions, so, let, well, last one, but in the meantime, I would invite also the other two speakers to, to join the table so we can di directly continue with the discussion. Uh, sorry, uh, this uh, area law that uh, we have for black hole, yeah. um, so there is a connection between area law and uh, the inverse of the coupling right. that you discussed. Yeah. Is it, uh, um, um, it, it can be, I mean, set also for the uh, entanglement entropy, which, <clears throat> which has the same uh, uh, area law. Or like in entanglement entropy. Uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean exactly. There is the geometric actually uh, correspondence yeah, yeah, right. between in, in the duality between gravity and the uh, field theory. So yeah, there is absolutely. this area. So, so by the way, yeah, thanks for asking this question because it, it's, it's up, it, that's absolutely true. But because uh, look, I mean entanglement entropy always goes like area in a, in a local interacting theory. It goes like area. And it goes like area in the units of the, the highest scale of the theory. Now, okay. Now, for example, uh, so that, that's why it's not surprising that black holes uh, entanglement entropy computed for a black hole matches uh, given Hawking entropy. Okay, uh, because if you properly uh, take into account cutoff dependence of the cutoff number of species, you see that it, you you get the same. Same would be true in this, uh, uh, automatically will be true for monopoles or baryons. Once you saturate the entropy bound. Now, if you take and saturate entropy bound and you compute entanglement entropy for that object, so let's say I, I trace the interior of a baryon, mm -hmm. I will get exactly the same entropy. I mean, because what again, is the coupling there? I mean, what, what, what is the interpretation a, for the coupling? Uh, it's a four-point function of goldstones. For instance, for the baryon, it's a four-point coupling of, of pions. It's a pion decay constant. So pion decay constant for, for any pur purpose of entropy computation, for a baryon, plays the same role as Planck scale pre plays for a black hole, okay? Mm -hmm. So therefore, the entropy there will be area, and no surprise, the, the fact that it's area is not surprising because entanglement entropy is always area. If I trade something in this room, I, of course, it will be area. But the, the scale is the scale of the theory, which is pi on decay constant, okay? So that will, will just go through, yeah. So, Start the discussion actually already started. And maybe we can switch it or something. Okay, I have also a question for Gia. So, but basically, yeah. it seems that the your interpretation of black holes are basically boson stars, non topological solitons. Um, and no, so, yeah, certainly they are non topological. I, 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 okay, unfortunately, I, um, I, I, all, all the time I plan to look into these boson, boson star stories, 
Um, what I don't know, I'm not terribly familiar with the literature, so therefore, I don't know whether you can really get a boson star in a, in a theory which is not hitting the strong coupling. So that I don't know. So therefore, for me, you see, if theory is strongly interacting, in other words, if alpha is strong, not alpha n, alpha n, of course, is all the one, but if alpha is much larger than one, and I, let's say, I have a theory, in, let's say, in which some alpha goes much larger than one, and then I show classical equations of, in this theory, uh, then, of course, I cannot trust them. Okay, so therefore, I, I don't know, so you should tell me. So boson stars, if this is checked that boson star you can have in a, in a completely well-defined, weakly interacting theory as, as a solution. It's just the same. The just mass, I mean, the just, just condition right. for the formation of the right. boson star. The, right. the charge you can right. obtain from studying the dispersion relation of, uh, of uh, the okay. the excitation just give that so now, that to, 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 if we take this assumption that we can have a theory which, uh, in which alpha is weak, weak coupling, and we have a, a self-sustained bound state, okay, in this theory, um, this bound state with a number of constituents mm -hmm. will satisfy this property. Yes. Because this we can see from yes. just... Uh, yes. Now, the thing is that, of course, uh, not every boson star will saturate entropy bound. Okay, mm -hmm. so, but what, what I claim, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely straightforward to show, that if you get, give me your solution of the boson star, I can deform the theory to push the boson star to saturate the entropy bound, and then the entropy bound, the entropy will be one over alpha. And this will happen at this point of saturating unitarity. Because for instance, I could do exactly the same deformation as I did for monopole. I can couple mm -hmm. uh, S1 sigma model to, to, the, to a boson star field, and the range in such a way that in the interior of the boson star, I, I break spontaneously a SON symmetry, okay? Mm -hmm. We have done that, for instance, for cubos. My, my student, Andre Colton and I, we have done it for cubos. We, 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 we are, okay, we have some papers in progress. Um, and it's the same, it's, it's exactly the same story, yeah. So, so boson star should also have a no key radiation. Sorry? Boson star should have a no key radiation. In this limit, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Once you saturate the, mm -hmm. once you saturate the bound, once mm -hmm. you saturate, so boson star, if it's a self-sustaining condensate, uh, will most likely will have depletion because there must be. You see, every time you have a condensate, because this is a property of condensates that they deplete, and at this point, everything is expressed through n. So that I guarantee, uh, it would be extremely strange if boson star has no depletion and no radiation. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, 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 that goes even without saturating the entropy. Because th th this is like in these critical condensates. We see that these critical condensates, they have Hawking-type radiation, even if they don't saturate the entropy bound. So that simply criticality uh, comes from criticality. Yeah. So yeah, according to us, you can say, if you want to translate in boson star language, effectively, gra the, the, the black holes in this description are like boson stars of, of gravitons, okay? So it's like, uh, or, or, or solid, or, or yeah. The composites of gravity. Okay, uh, yes. I guess as a relativist, now I'm confused about this last comment because uh, if a, a boson star has Hawking radiation from the point of view of the space time uh, interpretation, what is generating that? I mean, normally in the black hole, it's crucial to have, I mean, in a relativistic. Uh, Theory is crucial to have the horizon because yeah, that's to uh, you need to have an ergo region. So, are you saying that basically the the, the neutrons, the, the boson star is going to have uh, in that limit? In which sense is not a black hole then? If it okay, no, no, it doesn't have to have horizon for everyone. You see, the, the, no, no, this is an ex, ex, extremely important point, and I think I've destroyed the. This is not like a boson star, but exploding. Okay, so this is an extremely important point, and there's this general question. By the way, people were asking me, when, and, and we're trying to figure this out, not, to, not for the boson star, but for the, for the other, other soliton cases. In other words, there are two questions, right? So first, does the saturation of entropy require the existence of the horizon? And secondly, does the depletion require the existence of the horizon with respect to someone, okay? Um, now, the, the answer to the first, first question, um, I, I, I better not comment because we are in the process of trying to understand this. So, in other words, the, the point there could be that, uh, let's say I have a monopole, okay, or a baryon or whatever, and then I take this limit and I saturate the entropy bound. Now, 
the question is, in that limit, semi-classical description, of course, is, is fantastic, because we are in, at infinite n, basically, very large n, right? And now we can ask this question, I mean, is if I consider certain, uh, certain, certain excitations, is there a horizon for these excitations in this limit, okay? This doesn't have to be a universal horizon, just like you, what, you, what, you, what you are discussing. Your horizon is not horizon for, for, for others, it's just horizon for phonons. So the question is, would there be some sort of effective phonons in that theory with respect to which there must be a horizon? My intuition is, is, is yes, okay, why? Because at that point, I see explicitly there are infinite number of gapless modes, and it looks like that you can, okay, the, but again, I don't want to say, say uh, make a, a complete statement because we are trying to understand it. The second question is the same about Hawking radiation, right? So if you have Hawking radiation, now, as I said, Hawking radiation is a property of this, Okay, so why? Because for instance, if you take this uh, one dimensional bosons on a ring, literally, this is what's happening. If you compute the depletion coefficients, you see that the condensate depletes. Of course, it's not Hawking radiation because the system is one dimensional. Okay, it's, it's a non-relativistic system, etc. But what happens is that there's universal property. Once you produce a system, once there is a bound state of finite number of quanta, okay, and it's not topological, it's not, it's not maintained by any topology, a priori, uh, there is absolutely no reason not to have rescatterings because you have two quanta, they rescatter and one leaves the condensate because they are infinite. You see, if I do Bogolubo transformation, you always see that Bogolubo coefficients are, are non-zero, typically. It would be a miracle if you tell me that you have a composite object, okay, in a well-defined weakly interacting theory at the critical point and it doesn't deplete. It would be a total miracle, the finite end system, non-topological. You see, topological systems are different because topological constituents, they, they involve also boundary conditions. And so there the story is, is trickier because for instance, monopole cannot evaporate completely, okay? Or baryon, baryon is protect, again protected by uh, baryon number or topology. Uh, but for instance, I, I'm doing the following exercise now. So it's, it's really fun. So what you can do, you can do the following thing. You can take large NQCD, introduce quark flavors, Okay, and then break SON symmetry, sorry, SUN flavor symmetry explicitly by hand, okay? So you give, give quarks some hierarchy. So you produce hierarchy of pions and hierarchy of baryons and quarks. And so then you can have decay of a baryon. So the, the heaviest baryon in, in the, the given selection class cascades down, okay, by emitting, uh, by the same, it looks like very similar to Hawking radiation. So it's what happens in the case is that you have heaviest baryon, it emits stuff in the thermal spectrum. Well, not exactly thermal, but okay. And, uh, and decays down to the lowest mass object. Of course, then it, get, then it gets stabilized, okay? So yeah, so it's the same question there. I mean, do, can you always understand this as a horizon for someone? I mean, since there is a gapless mode, you can always think of a gapless mode as a redshifted mode. And from that point of view, you can always describe this as a horizon for someone, presumably. I mean, that would be my answer. I don't know whether this type of horizon is use, useful for understanding. Because you see, if you can always, uh, whenever you have a gapless mode, you can, you can effectively design a horizon for it, presumably. I don't know. But that uh, looks like sort of. Is question? No, if I can make a comment, I have the feeling that if you want to recover something that looks like a horizon in something that looks like a real black hole up in the sky, you have to give up homogeneity, you have to really look at the spatial distribution of your condensate, and this is going to be no, but, a no, little no, no, tough. The, but the question was not about universal horizon. Yes. We understand that, that you can only have in gravity. That's yeah, important. yeah, but... Now, the question is whether you can have a horizon type behavior for certain modes. Yes, that, uh, the same, right. I'm saying exactly right. that. There could be a cheap answer to that, because since in this criticality you always have gapless modes, when you move towards critical points, okay. you always have gapless modes, those are the ones that can entropy, you could always think geometrically oh, yeah. of this wow. as a redshift. Now, but, what but, I'm saying is that I don't know whether the, that type of description in terms of horizon is more useful than fundamental description. That's, what I, that's the only thing I don't know. Uh, but it's a very good question, so I don't know. By the way, I can ask you the converse question. For instance, um, maybe we should also, sorry, 
Yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. We, ah, no, do, we are not allowed to ask questions. questions for the yeah. other speakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, how far, but perhaps we connect to Bosnian and Condensates. How far can you push really the analogy between a black hole and the Bosnian and Condensate of gravitons? In the sense, the number of gravitons is not a conserved quantity. Of course, so, of course. So, absolutely. what does it mean that I have a Bosnian and Condensate of them, and what does it mean that it depletes? Meaning? Yeah, I mean, it's condensate in the, in the, in the poor man's uh, definition. Okay, these are, of course, we are, as you are absolutely right. We are in relativistic theory, obviously. Um, so, it's a condensate in the following sense that you have high occupation number of a typical momentum mode, okay? So, or you can say it's a coherent state, okay? So, it's, it's, so I use the, the word condensate in that sense. It's not that I, I'm doing thermal distribution and then they condense. I mean, if you wait for gravitons, they will never condense, okay? <laughs> they are, these are condensate because they are, they are driven there by, by other sources. But the, I think analogy is not just analogy. I think it's the, the, it's the same physics. In other words, I think that the physics, from the point of S matrix observer, okay? Uh, physics that uh, why uh, black holes form in, let's say, some S matrix process, uh, and why they form, why gravitons, how, how, why, why they can be described by gravitons as some kind of brown state, uh, is not terribly different from why baryons in large N can be understood as a, as a, as a, as a bound state of, of many quarks. In other words, you see, this is an important question because you see, every, I have to be extremely careful. When, I, when we talk about bound states, we have to be very careful, right? Because, for instance, I can tell you that this table is a bound state of molecules, right? And you will agree immediately, right? Okay, so you'll say, no, no, of course, it's, it's a bound state. Now, on the other hand, you could say, oh, what do you mean? I mean, this table is a quantum state? That's it. I mean, why do I have to think in terms of uh, molecules? Well, the reason we understand that it's useful to think about it as a bound state because molecules do not lose their personality in the sense that they are not terribly off shell in this bound state. In other words, to kick, up, to kick molecule out, I have to invest energy which is less than, way less than its, its, its rest energy. So the asymptotic molecule and molecule in this table are not terribly different. Now, for gravitons in this description, uh, the dispersion relation is modified order one. Okay, so therefore you are, you see, since it's critical, you are really halfway. They are not really gravi free gravitons because dispersion relation is modified, but it's not terribly modified. So it's not modified by 1,000. Dispersion relation is, uh, is controlled by alpha n. So I don't know. I, my, imp my impression is that all this amplitude story, et cetera, and all this fact that the same effects happen in these large n condensates, Indicates me that it's still very useful to think about it as, 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 as to think about them as, as, as composites. There's also right. B, C of photons. Ah, by the way, that's yeah, a good B, point. Yeah, B, C's of photons, or you can have um, you can have a laser, which is similar to a B, C in some ways. Right. Actually, we, we were hoping that maybe someone can do uh, with this with photon, for instance, uh, fo photons, uh, some kind of this kind of criticality experiments. I mean, there, there were some indications that maybe some can be done. Other questions? I don't know if it's possible to do any connection with uh, the were talks uh, in this conference about the possibility that. Uh, all right, to get some uh, hints of quantum gravity from uh, gravitational waves from uh, bringing down of black holes. So what, what do you think that uh, uh, analog gravity uh, effective theories can teach us because in that respect? Because that will be very important because as we learn, these, uh, uh, these measurements are completely dominated by noise. So we need uh, very good templates to Open, have any hope to, to that uh, evidence of quantum gravity on the deviation from general relativity. So what we can learn from analog gravity in, in that respect? About, about, about gravitational waves, like gen, um, the, I mean, quantum gravity and gravity. Of, uh, of the, of the, the core, uh, there may be effect of quantization uh, in the core that uh, may leave uh, some You're asking me. <laughs> okay, well, um, gravity, I guess, okay, 
you know, my, my analog black hole produces Hawking radiation, which is, you could think of it, I guess, as an analogy of, of, of um, Hawking ra radiation of, uh, of gravitational waves, of graviton. So I guess that's something that I'm interested in is how does the underlying quantum nature of, of the analog black hole, how would it affect the um, Hawking radiation? So it's a very interesting question, and I, and I think that we, should, we need theoretical predictions and experiments with stronger interactions so that we can see the effects of the uh, underlying quantum structure on the, on the Hawking radiation. Sorry, I'm confused about I'm confused about the question and the answer. <laughs> uh, well, every, sorry, I think we all are. We all are confused. Case, what forms the black hole is this external potential that you? What forms the horizon? Is this external potential to? Well, okay. The the, the horizon. Gravity. The horizon. Okay. The horizon. The, 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 dynamic, yeah, but it's not part of your dynamic. the potential is not the bl analog black hole. The, the analog black hole is the fluid which is flowing in the presence of the potential. What and the is the fluid, is where the fluid... The, 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 uh, the, the fluid flowing faster than the speed of sound, that defines the horizon. You can picture it... Ah, okay. You could picture it as being stationary, where you have this this potential, and then you have the 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 fluid, the potential. But the dynamics that generates the horizon is okay. not inside the. But then, once you're talking about dynamics, um, the dynamics is, is precisely gravity. In our in our situation, you can say in in a certain approximation, we don't have dynamics of the background. It's a it's a it's a constant background. Yeah, it's very exactly. semi-classical, and the sure. dynamics is the Hawking radiation itself. What you have is like an you It's like M plan going to infinity and the, uh, and the horizon fixed. So essentially, you you, you have yeah, it's like a fixed you have a uh, Schwarzschild radius fixed, and then and, and then you send G Newton to zero and the mass of the black hole to infinity. This is what you have. Well, eventually, I would like I would like for us to be able to see back reaction. I think that would be then um, to do a new generation of experiments with strong interactions, and we could see back reaction, and then we would have a more of a dynamical background. Uh, I think that I'm trying to, okay, uh, let, me, let me try to, 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 to answer the question in a different way. So you can take an acoustic geometry and this acoustic geometry you can, for example, tune it in such a way that this is Schwarzschild geometry modular conformal factor. Now, if you're asking me a question about um, propagation of linear air perturbation on this geometry, given that I have simulated basically the Schwarzschild geometry, I can simulate all the future, including the you know the light ring and so on. I mean, the geometry is simulated. That the linearized perturbation will per move in the same way. But if you're asking me anything that goes nonlinear, then I cannot uh, because there, uh, in a certain sense, you need uh, the full uh, theory, and the dynamics of this metric is not is not determined by the Einstein equation. So there are things you can do and things you can't do with, uh, with analog gravity. So from this point of view, having an int, about, I mean, you can't suggest uh, some new physics to look for, but then you have to apply the idea, the, the, you know, imagine if it is was suggesting indeed some quantization of the area, which it doesn't. But if it does, then, uh, for example, the talk we saw yesterday could be applied, uh, but just as an inspiration, but you wouldn't apply it uh, directly to analog gravity because... The answer would be model dependent somehow, especially when you go beyond the <laughs> regime. So, uh, there is nothing you can do about it. I don't know if this answer that you hear it. Another question? Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, uh, maybe if you use. Uh, uh, to, to follow up on this. Uh, on this uh, on this analog uh, gra gravity models, um, because w what what I'm really interested in uh, whether there is a there is a co connection because in se in certain sense the the model that I I told you the simplest one for instance you put put n bosons on a ring and that bot model you can solve it to death and the, no questions asked you can diagonalize Hamiltonian and everything and you see that the n attractive bosons on a ring 
um, they have strikingly similar properties at the critical point. Okay, so for instance, as I said, they have depletion, which is Hawking-like, uh, radiation-like. Uh, you have gapless nodes that, that store entropy. Uh, and you also have fast scrambling, actually. It's, it's, it's really interesting that if you can go into slightly over critical regime and then the, the, the system has Lyapunov exponent and it, it really, um, because there was this uh, conjecture idea by, um, uh, by Preskill and, uh, um, that, uh, the, and others that um, the, the fastest scrambling could be logarithmic. Uh, and you see that this system is, the, in that sense, is the fastest scrambler. It's, you see this perfect logarithm and stuff. So, but we, in that model, it doesn't seem to be any flow. It sort of connects to your previous question. Uh, so in, in other words, if I invert your question, because you are asking me whether there is a horizon in that model, right? For instance, in that toy model, all the properties are there whether there is a horizon. It looks like we can define a horizon because there is a gapless mode, and in some, in certain sense, probably there is a horizon. But then if I invert the question, the systems that you are looking at, uh, can I understand them as critical? In other words, uh, is there some, some way to understand the appearance of a gapless mode? And can you some, somehow move towards critical point and away from it and see that somehow uh, the, the radiation becomes less thermal. For instance, you, here you can. For instance, you can literally take Bose-Einstein condensate on a ring, and let's say you can change change parameters of the theory. For instance, size of the ring or, or 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 number of atoms, and you can move away from criticality, and you see that the depletion becomes less and less important, less and less Hawking type, uh, and and becomes like normal Bose-Einstein condensate depletion. Uh, and vice versa. So maybe in your case also you could like move, zoom in and out, and that would be very interesting. Sorry. I think I, no? heard, some, I, think I heard some proposals from the front row about about you? something about the criticality. Maybe they, someone else wants to answer yeah, that. Instead of, uh, because of what you were suggesting, yeah, in uh, this last uh, um, uh, proposal uh, is uh, to change the degrees of freedom, right? While okay, instead you could uh, change the coupling, yeah, right? Or, or, yeah, right? So to get uh, GN order of one. And so I think that this is something okay, that yeah. could, in principle, be done in these cold gases. Yeah, but then it would be interesting to see because maybe these this, this, this analog models are not so analog. Maybe they are even, even more connected. Because the, the system that, to, to me, the system, this is what I tried to, 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 to stress in my talk, that the, once the system has alpha n equals 1, and it exhibits all these properties of Bekenstein entropy, et cetera, it is more than an analog. It is it's, it's really the same same universal uh, uh, phenomena, how to say, it's large in physics. It looks like large in physics. It, it works universally as soon as you saturate entropy power. So maybe in, in, in those systems also you have the same thing. I don't know. It would be okay. very interesting. And uh, yeah, so what do you think there could be a, a relation between uh, uh, your idea and uh, uh, the weak uh, uh, gravity conjecture? So w what would be the yeah? The well, outcome? This this idea has nothing specifically to say about weak gravity conjecture. Uh, I mean, weak gravity conjecture for the, those of you that, 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 that know, you you are also on that paper, right? So okay, so it's, it's basically the, the there is a conjecture that gravity should be the weakest force in any given theory. So which means that you can, for instance, in my language, this would mean that you cannot make alpha if you couple large n QCD to gravity, you cannot make uh, n larger than uh, the alpha gravity. So that's what you would mean. Other than that, no, no, no specific relation. Because I mean, this all everything I demonstrated for the non-gravitational systems, you can work with zero gravity, so that automatically satisfies this conjecture. Even if you want to say that that's really a guideline, uh, so I don't see uh, from that. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, if you violate with gravity conjecture, then uh, this means that, for instance, if you have some inter, let's say QCD with n, which is much larger than the gravitational n. Uh, it would simply mean that the, the, the baryon in that theory would, so what would happen is that, yeah, baryon would collapse into a black hole before you can call it a baryon. So it's like, a, if, if n is very large, eventually you, you collapse into a black hole, baryon will be within its own Schwarzschild radius and uh, will stop to be a baryon. So there would be a limit to, to how far you can push 
<laughs> compositeness of baryon. You, a, oh, by the way, no, no, there is a way to understand. Yeah, the way would be, uh, yeah, yeah, no, thanks. The way would be that uh, the, 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 the constituents of, uh, so the, the black hole for, for a given size, black hole is the, is the object with, with, with highest number of constituents. Okay, so you cannot produce another object of the same size with larger number of constituents. That would be the translation of weak gravity conjecture in my language for, for this system. Yeah, so, I mean, which makes sense because then. Uh, in the usual language. Um, Alberto, can you take? Let's say if we if we just use the standard formulation of Bekenstein bound, etc. This this should be the statement that uh, somehow for a given size the black hole is what it's saturates. Maximal yeah, maximal atomic state. Right. Yeah, okay. Goes hand in hand. Yes. Right. So in other words, what we are learning in general is composite that means that if you have a... No, uh, yeah, can you take sorry. the... Sorry about this. So, so in other words, <laughs> if, you, if you want to uh, interpret in terms of composite, it, it seems that what is emerging from these considerations, that if you have a self-sustained system of N constituents, Okay, and well-defined constituents, I mean weakly interacting, weakly means collective coupling not larger than one, the maximal entropy they can sustain is N, which means that automatically since black hole has the largest number of constituents, it has largest number of entropy, it's, it's largest amount of entropy. Okay. And so, yeah, along these lines, uh, this also means that uh, uh, with respect to the confinement, the confinement uh, transition, then one has to see how much is G in exactly. a way to right. see whether you first are in the, if first you get, get into right. the maximum. Okay. Yeah, if you couple with gravity, you, of course, you have to be careful about confinement. You, okay. Right. I just wanted, I'm sorry, now I'm bouncing back to your question about if oh. the system uh, of an analog black hole can be seen as a critical, critical system. system. Right. Uh, it just your word that occurred to me that um, there is a comment I want to make is that if you have, uh, if you are close to form an acoustic horizon, you do have already some form of emission. Exactly. That, might, that however, be, uh, is not universal. When you form the horizon, it becomes good. universal. So this is something that was found, for example, in some papers, uh, theoretical papers by Renaud Parentani and collaborators. And um, the point is, what makes that universal seen from the point of view of the atoms? I mean, what's special about the flow that has an acoustic horizon from the point of view of the, of the atoms? How the atoms know that it has to be excited in that region and goes and, and become a part of a phonon? I can make a bet. Uh, I think it will be some alpha n equals one. Well, you will have some, some collective learn. coupling will become probably order one when you form a horizon. But this will be extremely interesting to check because this this will be an additional connection with the the, the all this uh, yeah, thermality yeah. entropy and horizon. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the case of the black hole, the entropy formula, yes, is uh, precise, and I expect that if you add higher derivative terms in gravity, there will be corrections that go like. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, there are the corrections that go like... You have to be careful, as you know very well. <laughs> you have to be careful. So in the case of your, again, I go back to the baryon, which is the yeah. prototypical one. Then there, in the very large n limit, this thing is becoming precise, but then there's the discreteness of the 1 over n thing, and you will get... You, 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 I mean... How do you make it sharp there? It's precisely the, it, it, is it the value of the number, or is the number of NF for which you lose confinement? So how do you make it very precise in the, because you gave it in a sort of, as a qualitative order of magnitude bound. Yeah, I'm going the other way around. In other words, I, 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 I simply, I, 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 I continue with large N counting of the entropy and see for which NF that happens. So now, if, you, if your question implies this was all, already was asked to me, uh, uh, whether you can precisely connect oh, the beta I got function. distracted, sorry. It was asked to now. No, 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 oh, no, not okay, before. Okay. Whether this could be connected with the beta function, <laughs> what, what's the precise connection with beta yeah. function coefficient and with this conformal window, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, these are uh, ex extremely interesting questions. I, do, I didn't check on the, I'm trying to sort of understand a few things, but I didn't check on the QCD dynamic side, what precisely this means, okay, when this happens. 
Um, also for the instantons, by the way, is extremely interesting that, you know, back in the past, there were some suggestions that you may have some phase transitions in QCD when the instanton um, at, at or to, to coupling order one, okay? Um, now, maybe this, this is the way the, the instantons smell um, this transition. In other words, it looks like that instantons violate, start to violate, saturate entropy bound for a Toft coupling equals one. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that there is some, there may be some very interesting no connection with non perturbative physics f through that. Okay, so now whether this is just an useful interpretation of already known facts or this can show us something new that I don't know. Uh, because nobody looked at QCD and the other dynamics from the entropy point of view. Sure, sure, sure. Nobody sure. Cares, you know, from Becken's time, nobody cares understand. about these things. But, but I think we should. So, okay. yeah. So, uh, I'm pretty sure that the uh, so um, I was thinking regarding the open temperature in uh, analog analog breakers. So. Since from your plot, the open temperature was about a tenth of a Kelvin, I guess. Around 0.4 nano Kelvin. Point four, yeah, 0.4 nano Kelvin. Yeah. And uh, you were saying the condensate itself is colder than one nano Kelvin. Yeah. Then can't you just measure it directly as a warming phenomenon of the condensate? We did that in... Yeah. Yeah, in one of uh, in our papers, a previous paper, we did look at the warming of the condensate by the Hawking radiation, but it's um, it has background. If there's any other source of warming, then you you see them both together. What's great about the correlations between the inside and the outside of the black hole is pretty much only Hawking radiation can make that type of correlation. So it's a it's a quieter background free measurement. But yeah, and certainly one can see that warming. Okay, it's time for lunch. Let's thank all the speakers again.